six, seven years. Uh, yes, he said in 2015, you came to our college. Last time you visited. Uh. Uh, hello, sir. How about the health of the Mr. Robot? Yes, is Mr. Robot is here? Professor, Professor Ujasa is asking about his health. Is he okay? Maybe he didn't hear me.你好。这是那个呃卡米尼卡中心的主任。Ciao a tutti. Spero che si senta. Ciao Andrea. Ciao, oh, si, si sente? Sì, sì, sì. Ciao, oh, Mila. 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 Mila.
Cuidado e viver. Good afternoon to everyone online. Uh, we are starting this uh, conference, uh, Congress online. I am Angelo Eugenio Fossati, president of the International Federation of Rockart Organizations. And I speak to you from Valcamonica in Italy, the first uh, Italian site on the UNESCO World Heritage List. With the consent of the convener, and the support of numerous associations and researchers adhering to IFRAO, I thought it would be useful to organize an online symposium. Also given the difficulty in recent years due to various uh, reasons of being able to organize uh, an in-person Congress. In fact, as you know, we regretfully had to give up the organization of two Congresses. And uh, this online one comes uh, even after three years of the pandemic due to the COVID-19. Our idea, I speak on behalf of the organizer of this online symposium, the Centro Camuno di Studi Preistorici, and the Footstep of Men Archaeological Cooperative Society, is that with this Congress, we are demonstrating to the world the rock art studies continue despite these difficulties and so also our function as association predisposed to the research, promotion and protection of rock art sites. We, are, uh, we have uh, therefore asked the various IFRAO member organizations to join this symposium, offering the opportunity to tell the general public and researchers from all over the world what research and activities they are carrying out. We also thought it would be interesting to welcome contributions from individual researchers who, adhering to the principle of IFRAO, want to disseminate their research. This is the first step. We are thinking to other events that can attract the attention of the general public to this fragile heritage of great historical and cultural importance that is Rocker. Thanks, therefore, to those who have decided to participate in this news from the World Intercongress Symposium 2023. To the convener of IFRAO, Robert Bernaric, for the suggestions. To the two representatives of the association who has accepted my invitation, Tiziana Cittadini of the Centro Camuno di Studi Preistorici and Andrea Arca of the Footsteps of Men um, uh, Cooperative Society and in particular to Valeria Damioli, Paolo Medici, who shared with me the technical scientific organization of the Congress, and to Marisa Giorgi for suggestions and help with the translations. So let's get the Congress started, and I leave the floor to Tiziana Cittadini that we talk on behalf of the Centro Camuno di Studi Preistorici. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Paolo Medici. I'm an archaeologist of the Centro Camuno. And uh, today I'm speaking uh, on behalf of our director, Tizia Cittadini. Um, she sends you her greetings, uh, but she regrets that because of an impediment, she cannot join us. Uh, she's glad to see uh, so many participants and researchers from all the continent of the world. And, and this is an important achievement for the whole uh, uh, Rockart community. Um, I will share the video. Okay. Um, today, I, I would like to, um, to speak about the um, Centro Camuno uh, Studi Preistorici project, uh, in particular, uh, the, the, very, um, the one that is uh, from the last years and uh, for some, something in the future. Um, we can divide the Centro Camuno uh, activities and uh, projects in uh, six main um, groups, uh, the archaeological researches, um, both in, of course, in, uh, on uh, the documentation of rock art and also in archaeological context. Uh, conference and seminars, 
such as the one that we are today uh, all together, uh, publications, uh, national and international collaborations, both with university, uh, in institutes, and so on, uh, database, archives, and the library, and in general, the professional support that we uh, provide uh, for the um, local community and in general also on the national international um, level. Um, I'd like to start with uh, and what, what is our main activity, let's say, in the institutional um, at, a, at a institutional level, that is the archaeological research. Uh, we have uh, five main uh, activity in this uh, in this um, in the in the archaeology. Uh, of course, the main one is the recording rockart fieldwork in Val Camonica. Um, that is the um, documentation and recording of um, rock art. In particular, we are working as, at least uh, now since 2010 on the uh, Foppe di Nadro uh, site. Um, this, this site is very important. Is uh, the research in this site started in the 70s, uh, but only now we are now we are trying to um, publish everything. Uh, we are already uh, in good advance. This this is the last year of research in Foppe di Nadro uh, for the rock art uh, documentation, and we hope to uh, by the end of the year or next year to publish the last. Uh, volume of the catalog, but we will see some some of them uh, later. Uh, of course, we have also an archaeological excavation at the site of Dosso di Nadro. is still in the area of Nadro, but is not not close to a uh, rock, uh, rock art area. So there are not so far <laughs> that we discovered uh, no uh, rock art in uh, in context. But anyway, we uh, try to understand better what is the material culture of the uh, of the area. Um, it's uh, only two years of the excavation so far. We found uh, um, some uh, something from Iron Age and something from Bronze Age. Uh, they are mostly two uh, shards of pottery, uh, one handle from late uh, Iron Age and one copper, uh, no, sorry, uh, Bronze Age um, shard. Uh, we are on, um, going to uh, um, open the area, excavate a little bit more, and see what we can find uh, better. Uh, we also have something more about a business archaeology, let's say, so pre preliminary archaeological impact assessment and uh, archaeological assistance, so mostly in the area of the uh, Riserva Naturale delle Incisioni Paestri di Ceto Cimbergo e Pasparlo, the, the site where we are also um, uh, the, scientific, uh, um, the scientific director. Um, together with this uh, more practical on the fieldwork uh, activity, we have also a more uh, researching activity, also um, always in archaeological uh, um, in the archaeological area. Uh, we have in particular four topics that we are uh, studying. Uh, the depiction of games in rock art, the communion rock art landscape and its correlation with engraved rocks, studies of zooarchaeology zoo applied to rock art and archaeobotanical study in Valcamonica. Uh, these uh, studies are um, uh, bring, on, uh, bring on by um, um, researcher that have um, that has a, a fellowship in uh, Valcamonic in uh, North uh, Institute, and of course, as soon as we have uh, the um, all the results, we will uh, publish it in our uh, BCSP or periodic. Um, the, uh, of course, another important activity of the Centro Camuno is uh, our conferences and seminars. Uh, in the conferences, uh, we would like to highlight uh, the last Valcamonica Symposium that we held in uh, here in, in Capo di Ponte, that is the 28th Valcamonica Symposium on rock art and a human heritage. And in 2021, where we uh, had a um, a large participation and uh, was uh, a very important, interesting uh, meeting uh, for all the rock art uh, researchers. Of course, the today conferences, so the news from the world, uh, IFRAO Internet Congress Symposium, 
And in June, in a couple of weeks, we will held also, uh, we are the venue of the first Italian symposium of Egyptology, where the um, Italian symposium of Egyptology asked us to be the venue of their first uh, Congress. Uh, beside of the conferences, we have also seminars. In particular, we have, um, we held a webinar at Milan University in uh, April, May to, uh, 2022, where we uh, had three uh, seminars uh, with our speakers. That was Silvana Gavaldo, Cristiana Gastaldi, and Paolo Medici. Uh, we brought uh, three different topics in this class that is, was inside uh, the um, larger uh, university class of the uh, Copper Ridge uh, Archaeology. We have also a meeting, a seminar, sorry, in a Hausburg University uh, in the uh, larger context of the uh, speaking about Iron Age in the Alps. And in particular, you, we spoke about use and the use of external imagery uh, in the Iron Age rock art of Valca Monica. And also in, the, in, in Venice University, uh, we, um, we had a seminar uh, in the um, international uh, class of the um, course of um, 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 cultural heritage management. Uh, the, the topic was the recording rock art methodology and the presentation of, uh, of it. Uh, we also had uh, always in, um, in 2022, uh, 2022, sorry, um, the, um, this two day seminar about the rock art of Alcamonica in the Alpine context, uh, another important uh, meeting that we had here. And of course, we are uh, continuing with our, our online seminars, uh, called Talking About Rock Art, that is an ongoing um, online uh, meeting. Um, you can find all the, um, all the, all the video in, on Facebook and YouTube. And most of them are also in English because we have also many international uh, speakers. Uh, of course, uh, or another activity that the Centro Camuno um, continue to, to bring on is the publications. Uh, we already published um, in the uh, 2019, uh, 2019, the um, Arte Rupestri Foppe di Nadro, uh, the second volume that was the uh, Mm, the publication of the catalog of the second area of Foppe di Nadro. Uh, the third one will be published, uh, as, as I told you, uh, probably this year or next year, with the last uh, catalog. And in the following years, probably we will try to publish also all the other areas of the, uh, of the middle uh, Balcamonic, in particular linked to the um, Riserva Naturale di Incisioni Rupestri, in order to have a uh, general venue and uh, catalog of all the rocks that are placed in that area. Uh, we, of course, have already published the 45th um, uh, issue of our Bolettino del Centro Comunista di Prehistorici. Uh, it's an ongoing um, uh, edition. And, uh, um, of course, uh, we, al we always um, uh, uh, search for new contributions. So it's an ongoing a call of paper, and so if everyone can would like to participate, is uh, welcome. Uh, we also have the publication of the proceedings of the seminar of the Congress Storia, Arte, Archaeology and Balcamonica, Sabine Franciacorta, was a larger, uh, not uh, rock art, for only rock art focused uh, Congress. Uh, of course, we have also the uh, um, publication of an important uh, research by Dario Sigari. Paleolithic rock art of the Italian peninsula. Uh, this is the um, publication of his uh, studies, in particular about uh, doctorate. And we also, the last one published was La Danza delle Origini, a book from, um, by uh, Gaudenzio Ragazzi uh, on the topic of the dance. In, uh, in general, not only in rock art, but in general in prehistory and uh, with an uh, uh, iconographic approach. Uh, future publication of, of is a photographic book. Uh, would we would like to um, continue, if you are uh, able, uh, not by um, to uh, publish the great, um, the great Rock of Naquane by Andrea Arca, 
of course, it is his research is very important, and we would like to publish it. Um, the, uh, we have also a book about uh, methodology, and as I told you already, the third volume of rock art. Um, we have many um, university international collaborations. Uh, we, we would like to uh, mention here some of them. In particular, we have a scientific collaboration with the University of Milan, uh, in particular with the Department of Cultural and Environmental Heritage, and the Jess de Mont in Edolo, that is a um, section of uh, Milan University here in, in the Valcamonica Valley. Um, we have a collaboration also with the University of Leiden for the participation of the student to the fieldwork. Uh, it's already three years uh, so far that we have um, students for Leiden, and we are really happy with this the collaboration. Um, we have an agreement for the internship program in, with the University of Bologna. Last year, we have already we had already four students. We'd like to continue with this collaboration because it's really important and really uh, also uh, proficuous. Um, sorry, uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kyrgyzstan uh, for an exchange. Uh, both in uh, knowledge, in technical, and also in exchange of, of personal idea between, of course, Kyrgyzstan and Italy. Uh, we have a um, collaboration to, uh, to, to realize a project that is called Rock Art Immersive, an idea for a digital art project. The participants are, of course, the Centro Camuno, the Kunstkraftwerk of Leipzig, uh, the uh, Institute of Cineca in, based in Bologna, and the other is the Fondazione Bruno Kessler in uh, Trento. Uh, we also have uh, um, uh, an agreement with the Museum of Tenda in France for the um, exhibition of comparative rock art of Montebego and Valcamonica to be transferred here in Valcamonica. Um, the we another important activity that uh, the Centro Camuno um, bring on is the uh, on daily work on database archives and the library. In particular, about uh, archives and database, uh, we we finished the first trance of the project, the correspondence of the origin of art, uh, where we organized the historical archive of documents and the correspondence. In particular, we focused on the uh, documents where we found also um, the, the, um, let's say the exchange of, uh, in, in the period when the UNESCO, um, the Valley was inserted in the UNESCO uh, World Heritage List. Uh, we also are reorganizing the tracing archive. Uh, the, 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 the aim is to uh, enlarge the space available for the tracings in order to store better them and also to uh, have a safer way to uh, store them. And of course, also, it's, it will be easier to digitalize it. Uh, we are ongoing, of course, in this digitiz digitalization of the both photographic archive and also of the tracing archive. And um, the idea is also to continue the idea. We are continuing to implement the database. Uh, both uh, the, um, the, we are trying to put together photographical archive, uh, archaeological database data, and so on, and also the um, GIS, so the geographical information linked to them, in order to have everything in one place and everything can be uh, linked all together. Uh, in the library, we are uh, reorganizing our library that contains uh, over uh, more than 45,000 volumes. And we have also a collaboration um, for a, to have a steady librarian here in, uh, in the Institute, because it's really important to continue the exchanges uh, on the uh, library. Um, for, um, at the end, uh, our activities, not only on research and uh, this kind in the, in this uh, uh, more institutional um, uh, jobs, but we have also a uh, professional support uh, for the mostly for the local community. Uh, so we have archaeological consultancy, in particular for the uh, pilot project uh, in the Reserva Rural and Cisoni Rupestri, 
Um, so we mostly have an advisory um, uh, task. Uh, we, of course, have also consultancy for the museums, uh, in particular for the Museum of the Reserva, where we designed and we also mounted the uh, new um, uh, venue of the museum. Uh, we do also, of course, archaeological uh, um, consultancy, in particular cartography, um, scientific advisory, technical uh, um, consultancy, and so on. So we, so we uh, also work on uh, in order to have uh, to be able to help everyone in the archaeological area. Uh, as I told you already in the first slide, we have archaeological supervision and assistance. Um, we try to also uh, be part in the archaeological valorization of our uh, areas. Um, when we are able, or we can, we, we, we supply of also the digital photographic material, uh, thanks to our large uh, photographical and tracing archive. And then we are also the scientific direction of the Riserva Naturale delle Incisioni Rupestri, Ceto Cimbergo Traspardo. Um, these are our uh, main activities. Of course, we, we do also a lot of other uh, daily activities, but this uh, is uh, the, let's say, last two years and the future of uh, our uh, um, institute. Um, uh, Tiziana, unfortunately, cannot be here, uh, but um, she is very, she told me just before the, the starting of the, of the conference that she's, she's really happy uh, that we are all together here. Uh, thanks for your um, uh, attention and uh, bye. Thank you very much, Paolo, and uh, for your presentation. We will have a little discussion at the end of uh, one, two, three, four, five presentations, okay? So uh, stay online with us, please. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, not only you, I mean all the <laughs> persons that are here today. And now uh, I give the room to Andrea Arca of the Footsteps of Men Archaeological Cooperative Society that we talk about the most re recent activities of uh, uh, footsteps. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much. I hope um, it's okay. Please again, give me a reply because I don't see my presentation. Uh, how do you see? Anyway, I'm Andrea Arca and I'm presenting the most recent uh, activities of Footsteps of Man Archaeological uh, Society. Andrea, per favore, sì. metti la presentazione grande perché non c'è, cioè vedo solo il riquadro con tutte le slide. Questo è il problema. Adesso si vede? Eh, okay. ok, sì, sì, questo era il problema. Ok. Uh, Footsteps of Man Archaeological Society, the most recent uh, activities. Uh, so these are not um, all um, the works we did in recent years. There are other, but these are the main, and uh, the main uh, about which uh, it's uh, important to, sp to, to, speak, to speak about. So um, I, I will focus on three uh, sites, three subjects, three rocks particularly. Uh, one, uh, in uh, Aosta Valley, all these three sites are in the north of Italy, in the Alpine Arc. So the first site is Chen Chenal, engraved rock and shelter at Montjové, is the Aosta Valley. <laughs> the number two are the prehistoric rock paintings from the Ossola Valleys in Piedmont, in the north of the Piedmont. And the third one is engraved rocks and rock paintings from the Paspardo area of the Volcamonica. Um, Volcamonica is the dear image I have under my head. Uh, um, bef uh, be Dietro, uh, my, my head that you may see on, on the screen. From the top, uh, uh, Chenal, Osso Valley, Paspardo in Valcamonica, and Paspardo in Valcamonica. So at uh, Chenal, uh, um, we have uh, in reality two, um, two rocks. One is a shelter, and I will uh, firstly, firstly speak of this shelter. Uh, it's, uh, it's the rock number three of uh, Chenal. 
And um, the other is the number one, which is known uh, from 50 and more years. And uh, it's a very large boulder. Uh, in uh, this case, uh, the work is uh, it's uh, still uh, in uh, in project. So um, what uh, uh, we find, uh, uh, what we may find uh, in the, uh, uh, no, 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 sentito, scusa. Uh, what we may find uh, in this uh, Chenal shelter, you may see here a, a 3D, sorry, a 3D model. And um, it's very important because we, make, we may find uh, uh, Neolithic mast light and snake-like figures, Copper Age uh, AI-like figures, Bronze Age schematic anthropomorphs, and uh, Middle Age uh, scratched figures uh, on the top of the mask-like uh, mask figures, on the middle uh, the ALI coculiform figure and on the bottom the schematic uh, anthropomorphic figures or praying so called praying figures. Uh, one of the um, most important features of this uh, engraved shelter, it's a vertical wall as you, you have seen, are the comparison which are able to date the engravings of this, this shelter. So um, we have a very strictly strict uh, um, comparison with the Brittany megalithic rock art of the fifth millennium BC, um, 4,300, 4,200 BC, so more than 6,000 years ago. On on the left of the of the plate, you may see the Chenal shelter figures with mask like uh, U-shaped uh, figures and snake like figures. And on the right, uh, um, figures from Brittany, Barnenetz, Ilong, Barnenetz, Manelud, which are clearly very, very similar. And so testify the same chronology of the two sites, uh, which are anyway very distant because more than uh, quite 1,000 kilometers of distance between uh, uh, Aosta Valley and uh, uh, Brittany. Uh, but not only Neolithic uh, comparisons of the fifth millennium, also Copper Age uh, third millennium BC comparisons. Um, on the bottom left, uh, you may see uh, painted figures from the Iberian uh, Spanish uh, schematic art, El Arte Esquematico, Oculados in Spanish, which is uh, idol AA figures, um, which are dated to the Calcolithic of the third millennium BC, the full Calcolithic, uh, similar figures we, we have found and traced on these uh, uh, Chenal uh, shelters. Shelter where um, we have uh, uh, traced uh, seven, uh, seven sectors. And um, now I try to show you um, the tracing. This is the entire um, tracing. Mm, uh, work at Zen in Vector, um, Vector Graphics, a, a work uh, performed by um, foot, Footsteps of Man, uh, in this case, uh, Andrea Arca, Angelo Fossati, and uh, Francesca Morello worked uh, on it, but also with the collaboration of uh, Svapa, Societe Valdotin d'Archéologie et Préhistoire, and uh, under the scientific uh, coordination of the uh, uh, Aosta Valley um, Archaeological Superintendents. Uh, after the tracing, as usual, we do the catalog of figures. Here you, you may see uh, some of the most important figures of, uh, of this shelter. And uh, we had the two scientific uh, publications, um, obviously with uh, all the archaeological data and, uh, and so on. And this was the uh, rock number three of uh, the Chenal sites in Aosta Valley. Then we move uh, of a few meters, no more than 50 meters of distance between rock uh, three and rock one. Uh, this is the rock one, a very large boulder, um, where uh, we, we, we can find here on the top, uh, probably composition uh, of uh, a Neolithic axis, a stone axis, uh, on the bottom left cap marks, uh, on the middle of the, of the bottom, a um, spiral pendant figure, copper age, and right uh, on the right uh, of the bottom, um, uh, sharpeners and uh, grids. Also, in uh, in this case, uh, we may take uh, a look of uh, at the size, so uh, we may enjoy the alpine environment. Uh, 
uh, this uh, this is not a, a video it's a, a panoramic uh, um, spherical uh, photographs and uh, then rendered by software and uh, now there is no snow but uh, in winter uh, uh, it's uh, easy to have snow there so we can see some figures from uh, from uh, from this shelter we close uh, uh, the video and we move on and we go to the second uh, site, which is uh, in Ossola uh, Valleys, uh, more than one valley, the main one uh, and the minor uh, valleys. Uh, we have uh, uh, three sites, uh, the, the Balma dei Cervi, uh, the Balma del Capretto and the Balma della Vardaiola. And they are not uh, very distant one uh, from the other. Uh, Balma in the um, Piedmontese uh, uh, language means shelter, and uh, also in French, boom. And uh, Cervi means deers, capretto deer, capretto means uh, uh, little goat, and Vardaiola means the, a site from where it is possible to underlook uh, the, the, the bottom of the valley and to control uh, um, the passageway and, uh, and so on. So three sides, uh, it's a very mountainous area. And uh, on, the, on the left, you may see the Balma de la Vartaiola site, uh, which is the highest in altitude, more than uh, 2,200 meters over the sea level, and uh, also mountains with uh, glaciers and uh, so on. Obviously, in, in, in winter, this site is really um, full of snow. It's a, it's a regional park. It's a very important environmental area for the protection of alpine um, fauna and, uh, and flora. Anyway, you may see that the uh, houses shelter are really very vertical uh, walls. So um, I speak only one of the first, of the most important one. Um, to say is that uh, many uh, recording methods have been applied. Um, um, most recent also uh, recording meters have been applied to this uh, shelter, the Balma dei Cervi, uh, with uh, um, iconographic uh, digital uh, tracing. You take a look. Uh, you may take a look uh, to the uh, picture over where you may see the, the process of uh, digital extraction of the figures to obtain uh, the tracing. Uh, obviously, with the color enhancement, and all people know very well. Uh, the work of uh, Jonna Arman uh, about uh, this stretch uh, that is now um, worldwide uh, diffused. Uh, um, orthophoto mosaics, we, which mean uh, uh, very high def uh, pictures uh, extracted from the 3D models, 3D models uh, photogrammetrical, uh, SFM, spherical pictures, uh, has one you, you, uh, you, you see uh, before from uh, Chenal. Uh, analysis, pigment analysis, uh, here uh, a, a moment of taking a sample, all this work obviously have been done under the scientific, with the scientific uh, uh, cooperation and coordination of the archaeological uh, uh, superintendents of the Piemont, Novara province, and also an archaeological excavation was performed there. Uh, finding some little uh, um, um, fragments of uh, a Neolithic uh, pot, one uh, little fragment of a Neolithic pottery of uh, um, fifth uh, millennium, the late fifth millennium before Christ. But uh, um, it's important to stress out uh, the fact that after uh, making a study and a recording, it's um, very important, it's fundamental to have uh, to catalog uh, both of the, the records and the figures. Here is the software um, we utilize, uh, uh, which is uh, called the database specific software, database specific uh, software for ROCART, which is called the RARO, Raro ROCART Recorder. Here you may see the ROC record. Um, obviously, our, our, all fields are, are to be filled uh, with text uh, and uh, also uh, pictures or, or drawings. And uh, on the contrary, here you can see the figure record of uh, one figure of uh, Balma dei Cervi with uh, text, with uh, uh, photographs, uh, uh, with uh, tracing. You can open and close, add and, uh, and uh, take away uh, images. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have text uh, fields, but also a pull down list uh, where you can uh, choice uh, each, uh, um, each typology, which is relevant to, to the figures. So, and this software uh, not only is, is uh, able 
to um, to record uh, rocks and figures but also to produce uh, the catalog, the one you, you saw before, uh, it's the producing in HTML, but also to have a statistic uh, calculation and so on. So it's very useful for rock art studies. And this was applied, applied to all, all the rocks where uh, normally um, footsteps of men do the work of uh, recording. Um, more and more um, has uh, the Balma de Cervi, it's a dangerous site, so it's uh, it's not possible to to consent the access uh, to people um, because it's very ancient. There is a risk uh, of uh, damage, and also it's uh, dangerous to to climb over. There is uh, a virtual museum at the site uh, uh, www. Um, dot balma dei cervi dot hit. Um, a, um, it's simply you, you click to a little door, you open the shelter, and uh, you can have a, a, a scenic uh, tour. You can uh, uh, see it as uh, you are in the site. You can zoom on, zoom, zoom out, uh, um, go right, go left, and take a look to the uh, surrounding uh, panorama. And uh, on the right, on the left, here you, you see the mountains, there is still some snow. Uh, the soil, in the soils of uh, archaeological digging is worth performance after this picture. And uh, it's really a huge uh, rocky wall where uh, uh, these interesting uh, prehistoric uh, pictures were, were found. So in this virtual tour and virtual museums, uh, mm, pictures uh, and um, figures can uh, be uh, looked at that very, very near and uh, uh, with the color these obviously are fake colors uh, and answered it's more easy to to, to see uh, figures uh, on the online site than uh, on the real site even if uh, obviously a virtual visit, visit can never substitute a real one uh, you can also mm, closely take a look at to, to the tracing all figures uh, have, a, have a number uh, the sector D, E, and so on, the credits of this uh, of this huge uh, um, tracing, mm, and more um, 3D models where you can uh, turn the rock as do you want, the entire panel or, or a, a sector, and uh, so to have an idea of um, the surface of this so of this rock, of this painted shelter. So uh, a work performed uh, recently by um, footsteps uh, of men. I did the. the uh, the online model and the virtual tour. Um, so we move to the third um, site, uh, which is uh, um, the most important area of, uh, of the Alps, um, along with Mount Bego, Mount Bego and Volcamonica. Volcamonica and Mount Bego are the, the <laughs> uh, obviously the most important areas of uh, uh, engraved of engraved rocks of the Alps, but also in Europe and um, also in, in the world, they have a, a great a great place. Uh, you can see here where Valcamonica is, the north of Italy, in yellow the Lombardy, and uh, in blue, bl light blue Valcamonica, which is the valley of the uh, Olio River, which is really full full of figure, uh, starting as I said, uh, um, Neolithic as for um, maps, but also uh, we have some uh, um, Paleolithic uh, figures, not, not a lot, but very, very interesting. So going over Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Middle Age, and recent times, so starting from uh, 10,000 years before Christ, 11,000 years before Christ, and now we have 13,000 years of engraving activity on the uh, sandstone of, of this valley. So recording, study, and publication of engraved rocks and rock paintings, from the Paspado area, um, which is one of the most densely historiated complexes of all the Camonica Rocard at Paspado. Indeed, uh, um, for in more than 35 years of field works, footsteps of men worked uh, on more than 200 engraved rocks. So we can see here a image of uh, Costa Peta Samber figure, while on uh, top uh, we have uh, an image of uh, a western slope of Volcamonica and on the bottom an idea of, uh, of a map with a diffusion of uh, all the sites which are many and of the uh, engraved rocks of the uh, Paspardo area which is uh, as uh, Capo di Ponte as Fabrinadro as Campanina and other really very very rich because here we have uh, the, the most uh, uh, a, 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 a most suitable rock surface to be engraved. So, 
we can't speak uh, obviously of all the rocks i show only uh chronological period so starting from the neolithic uh, um late neolithic uh, the first half of the fourth millennium before christ uh, um, we have the so-called maps of topographic composition, right, uh, left uh, the rock 20 of the Vita in Pardo area and right uh, rock 29, which are probably the depiction uh, of a, a, a anthropic landscape, cultivated fields um, with the cereals and enclosures and uh, so on. It's not a natural, uh, obviously, an environment, uh, and that it's not to say that it really depic depicts the, the, the landscape of panorama, but uh, on the contrary, it depicts uh, maybe an, uh, an ideal, uh, ideal landscape. Moving on with the next archaeological period, which is the Copper Age, in this case, the full Copper Age, uh, quite all the uh, third, third millennium before Christ, we have a monumental composition at, in the Paspado area and also obviously in, in Balcabonica and ground rocks with the figures of daggers, halberds, deer and vestments. On the right, the, the well-known Capitalo di Dupini, which is the symbol, the logo of the uh, communion center uh, of uh, prehistoric studies. Uh, on the top, a uh, half sun-like figures or, or a deer horn. Um, remedellian, remedellian kind daggers, a triangular blade and a flat base, and on on the bottom, not plants, not flowers, but halberds with flint blade, and um, on the right, which are typical of the, the first half of the third millennium before Christ, three thousand two thousand five hundred before Christ, and the deer figure, a dagger figure figure on, on the middle and on the left, a, a, relate, a female related figure, probably a goddess or a deity with a representation of a concerting c c uh, circles that probably represent the female jewels like necklaces, uh, earrings, or maybe a soul or a vestment uh, of uh, a figure of a very, very important from, uh, from for this kind of uh, representation. Uh, go on, uh, we go on uh, to spiral area with Bronze Age, with figures of weapons, uh, right top uh, spears, uh, and left down a schematic anthropomorphic figure with stick, stick body, stick uh, legs, stick arms, stick neck, so-called uh, praying uh, figures. And finally, to the Aryan Age, uh, many, many subjects, among many, among, uh, many other weaponed figures, uh, dualist uh, huts, uh, pediforms, deer, Camunian roses, deer hunting scenes, ornithomorphs, inscriptions in the North Etruscan alphabet. Uh, in the middle down, we may read an Etruscan, North Etruscan, and a Camunian alphabet inscription, we can read it, but we can't translate, it's not in European language. Um, top right, uh, so-called Rosa Camuna, uh, deer and top and um, middle left uh, a cart, a shovel, and uh, a deer three Iron Age figure, which anyway are not uh, in this case uh, directly associated on right, the bottom right, to dualist, uh, which is one of the most uh, well known subjects in Volcamonica, Rocart, and also as Baspado. So thank you very much uh, from uh, myself, uh, from Anderka, and from Footsteps of Man Archaeological Society. In Italiano, Cooperativa Archeologica Lorme dell'Uomo, which is based on Cerveno in Valcamonica, Brescia uh, province in Lombardy, uh, www.rupestre.net. Here is the email. Um, people which is, uh, who, interest, who, who is interested is kindly invite you to take a look to Valcamonica Required Field School and Fieldwork 2023 from 20 July to August 10, 2023. And uh, a link here, and also um, you are kindly invited to visit the Valma dei Cervi Virtual Museum at www.valmadeicervi.it. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think that I must uh, disconnect. Okay, here, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thank you, thank you very much, Andrea, for your. Uh very important presentation and uh, uh, unfortunately we couldn't see the video you probably didn't share the video so anyway for the next time uh, you should uh, probably share the video uh, doesn't matter thank you very much um, we go on with Silvia Sandrone of the uh, Pound uh, Museum 
uh, she will talk about uh, the Museum of Marvels, a lively permanent exhibition place and research center closely linked to the Mount Bagos Valley. Thank you, Silvia. It's up to you. Merci Angelo, euh, merci euh, de, pour cette invitation. Euh, donc je suis là pour présenter euh, à tous les participants euh, le musée départemental des merveilles à Tende, qui est le musée que je dirige et qui est le musée de référence pour le site de gravure rupestre de la région du Montbégo. Donc, euh, la présentation, euh, elle va être une présentation euh, générique euh, du site pour vous montrer où se situe euh, le site archéologique euh, et euh, aussi pour vous montrer euh, les roches qu'on retrouve euh, sur le site archéologique. Et après, je vous présenterai bien sûr le musée parce que c'est ça le but de cette intervention. Euh, et surtout, euh, pour vous parler du rôle hein, des établissements culturels dans le cadre de la diffusion de la connaissance et de la sauvegarde de, de, de sites de gravure rupestre. Dans le site de la région, de la, de la région du Montbégo se situe dans les Alpes du Sud. Donc, on est euh, dans les Alpes méridionales, à la frontière entre l'Italie et la France. Euh, et c'est un carrefour de passage entre la côte Liguro euh, et euh, française et la plaine du Pau. Euh, le site s'articule autour d'une montagne, qui est une montagne assez élevée, on est à 2842 mètres d'altitude, qui s'appelle le Mont Bégo. Et autour de ce site-là, euh, on a un attendu de environ 14 km euh, de site archéologique. C'est le plus grand site monument historique classé français, pour vous dire. Donc, on se situe, euh, pour ce qui concerne la partie administrative, dans le département, le département des Alpes-Maritimes. Donc, on est en plein en sud de la France. Et euh, tout le site est sous la commune de Tende, que vous voyez entouré en rouge en haut de la, de la carte. Là, c'est un, un aperçu que je vais vous donner de, euh, du site et surtout des deux vallées principales du site, qui sont la vallée dite des Merveilles et la vallée dite de Fontanalbe. Les deux vallées... Euh, comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, ont un attendu d'environ 14 km et sur environ 4000 roches ont été retrouvées euh, 50 000 gravures rupestres. Ces 50 000 gravures rupestres, normalement, sont divisées en deux parties. Il y a des gravures qui sont datées du néolithique final jusqu'à l'âge du bronze moyen. Et après, toute une partie de gravures qu'on nomme historique qui date de l'époque romaine jusqu'à nos jours. Donc, les deux vallées principales, Vallée des Merveilles et la Vallée des Fontanalbes. Et ça, c'est les paysages que vous rencontrez quand vous visitez le site. On est à notre montagne, on est à plus de 2200 mètres d'altitude. Donc, c'est un paysage d'origine glaciaire. Euh, vous reconnaissez euh, les vallées en forme de U, euh, les blocs erratiques, euh, les verrous glaciaires. Hein, donc, c'est vraiment un paysage issu euh, de la fin de la dernière glaciation. Et dans ce paysage, donc, il faut bien imaginer euh, environ 4000 roches gravées, parsemées, autour de euh, montagnes assez élevées, en ce cas, c'est les pics de merveille, avec euh, au pied euh, les dalles euh, moutonnées. Donc, c'est des dalles, celles-ci aussi, euh, d'origine glaciaire. Vous pouvez bien euh, repérer le polissage euh, issu des glaciers du Quaternaire. Et dans ce paysage-là, et bien sûr, vous trouvez euh, toutes les gravures. Euh, là, c'est une image qui présente le Mont Bégo. Le Mont Bégo, c'est la montagne qui est au centre de ce comprensoire rupestre d'excellence. Tout à l'heure, André Arca disait que dans les Alpes, Valcamonica et, et Bégo sont les deux, euh, sont les deux euh, sites euh, plus, les plus connus et les plus importants. Euh, je suis d'accord avec lui. Et donc, en effet, pour... Euh, vous citez le site de la région du Mont Bégo. C'est important aussi de parler du Mont Bégo, qui est au centre de ce, de ce territoire. Je vous disais tout à l'heure, c'est une montagne qui est assez élevée, mais euh, elle n'est pas la plus élevée des Alpes du Sud, loin de là. 
Mais en tout cas, se trouve au centre d'un territoire avec des roches sédimentaires de, du Permien. Donc, il s'agit de pélite, la même typologie de roches que vous retrouvez à Ovalcamonica. Et euh, ces pélites, avec euh, des pâturages tout autour, hein, richesse d'eau, euh, la montagne au centre, et donc euh, toutes les caractéristiques d'un site de gravure rupestre, ont fait que les hommes d'il y a 6000 ans ont gravé euh, sur les roches euh, leur euh, signe, euh, que j'y montrerai au, au, un peu plus tard. Et, euh, et là, c'est surtout pour montrer la, la, vraiment le, le, le spectaculaire de ce paysage. Ce paysage, il est vraiment spectaculaire. Hein. Donc, euh, euh, les dalles polies par les glaciers qui ont été euh, utilisées comme des ardoises euh, naturelles par les hommes de la protohistoire. Non, je vous disais tout à l'heure, on a une grande partie de ces gravures qui sont datées euh, du, de l'époque protohistorique. Donc, on est en éthique finale à l'âge du bronze moyen. Ces gravures, c'est surtout des animaux avec des cornes, qui sont des bovidés. Après, on a des armes, des armes à la fois des poignards et des halbardes. Et après, des figures géométriques, euh, comme des euh, cases juxtaposées euh, les uns à côté des autres, qu'on appelle en français réticulées. Et donc, c'est ces motifs-là, toujours les mêmes, qui sont répétés des milliers des milliers de fois sur les roches. On a bien sûr aussi des anthropomorphes, dont le plus célèbre, le sorcier, que, euh, qui est le symbole du, du musée. Euh, mais en tout cas, c'est vrai que la caractéristique euh, des gravures rupestres de la région du Montbégo, c'est le fait que c'est très peu de catégories répétées des milliers de fois. Donc, les animaux avec les cornes, souvent trouvés euh, aussi attelés, donc avec des arrières, des attelages, des armes, poignards et albardes, des figures géométriques, dont surtout des réticulés, et après des anthropomorphes, qui sont des anthropomorphes simples ou des anthropomorphes un peu plus exceptionnels, entre guillemets, comme le sorcier. Après, on a aussi, comme je vous disais, une partie des gravures historiques qui sont datées de l'époque romaine jusqu'au siècle dernier. Et là, c'est des gravures qui, lient, euh, qui sont liées au pastoralisme, beaucoup, parce que le lieu, c'est un pâturage d'estive euh, qui était très fréquenté et qui continue d'être très fréquenté à ce jour. Après, on a des gravures de militaires, on a des gravures, des gravures de marins, on a des gravures de, de populaires, de gens de la vallée. Et euh, on a aussi des gravures de voyageurs, de voyageurs qui sont passés sur le site pour euh, des questions touristiques et qui ont laissé donc, les traces de leur passage à partir du XVIe siècle. Euh, donc, le site, c'est un site d'altitude. On est, comme je vous disais, à environ 2200 mètres d'altitude. Euh, C'est un site alpin, il faut marcher beaucoup pour y accéder. Et donc, pour des questions euh, à la fois pratiques, touristiques et culturelles, euh, il a été décidé de construire à Tende. Donc, on est, euh, comme je vous ai montré tout à l'heure sur la carte, on est au fin fond de la vallée de la Roya, on est à quelques kilomètres de la frontière avec l'Italie dans les Alpes-Maritimes françaises, il a été décidé de construire un musée. Non, le musée a été construit en 1996. On a, avec une muséographie, après la muséographie a été faite évoluer en 2006 et après ça a été complètement revu en 2019. Il s'agit donc de musée qui est quand même assez grand. On est, environ, on est sur environ 900 mètres carrés d'accessibilité au sol. Euh, on fait euh, chaque année de 1 à 2 euh, expositions temporaires. Je vous montrerai celle de cette année. Et après, on a bien sûr une grande partie destinée à, euh, à l'exposition permanente autour des gravures rupestres. Euh, C'est là pour vous dire que le Musée des Merveilles est à la fois un lieu de visite, mais Via, grâce à la diffusion des connaissances qu'on fait euh, à l'intérieur du musée, on contribue aussi à la sauvegarde du site. Ce n'est pas le musée qui gère le site, ce n'est pas le musée qui surveille le site. Le site est en plein cœur d'un parc national français qui s'appelle le Parc national du marc Antour, mais euh, c'est un partenaire pour le, pour le musée. Mais le musée est un service culturel du département qui se doit qui se doit d'accueillir les visiteurs pour expliquer euh, l'histoire, euh, 
je vous montrerai tous les espaces. Mais euh, vraiment, j'y tiens au fait de dire que le musée est vraiment à la base de la diffusion de la connaissance et par cela euh, contribue vraiment euh, à, de façon très importante à la sauvegarde euh, du site. Parce qu'on croit on croit fermement au fait que c'est grâce à la connaissance qu'on euh, empêche euh, ou quand même on diminue euh, les actes de vandalisme. Et c'est grâce à la connaissance aussi qu'on euh, diffuse la connaissance du site auprès d'environ de, euh, euh, entre 20 000 et 35 000 visiteurs par an. Ça dépend euh, des années. Bon, ça, c'est l'entrée de notre musée. Euh, c'est un musée qui est très interactif. On a des, 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 des interactions continues avec le visiteur, avec de, des films, avec des projections 3D, avec des projections au sol. Donc, c'est une galerie qui est une galerie de 700 mètres carrés. Et dans cette galerie-là, on explique donc les différents aspects du site. Ça aussi, je trouve, c'est très intéressant, le fait d'avoir à côté des sites de gravures rupestres, euh, à minima un centre d'interprétation, euh, qui permet de remettre le site dans un contexte, donc de, de, de vraiment contribuer à l'enrichir le, d'informations, euh, avec des informations que vous ne pouvez pas repérer directement sur le site. Donc, c'est pour cela que nous, on conseille toujours aux visiteurs de coupler l'expérience avec la visite du site et la visite du musée. Parce que sur le site, il y a les gravures originales, ça va sans dire, vous avez le paysage qui est vraiment magnifique à la Vallée des Merveilles et à la vallée de Fontanalbe. Donc, euh, vous avez le spectacle du paysage, le roche dans le contexte, mais vous n'arrivez pas à repérer euh, des informations euh, euh, en quantité et en qualité autour du site. Sinon, via des panneaux d'interprétation qu'il y a sur le site, mais ce n'est pas du tout un musée. Tandis que dans le musée, vous pouvez enrichir vraiment l'expérience, la, la découverte du site via euh, plein d'espaces qui sont des espaces thématiques, des expériences, comme je vous disais, comme je vous disais euh, interactives, multimédiales. Et, euh, et donc, on conseille tout le temps de coupler la visite du site avec la visite du musée. Donc, euh, on présente d'abord, bien sûr, le paysage avec la géologie toutes les typologies de roches qu'on peut retrouver sur le site, et tout particulièrement les roches que vous voyez au centre, euh, rouges et, et vertes, qui sont les pélites, hein, sur lesquelles les hommes du Néolithique ont gravé euh, la quasi-totalité des gravures rupestres. Euh, il s'agit d'une histoire géologique qui est très très longue, parce que ça date du carbonifère jusqu'aux périodes les plus récentes avec l'insurrection des Alpes. Donc c'est vrai que c'est déjà un joyeux du point de vue euh, géologique, euh, la région du Montbégo. Et dans le, à l'intérieur de, de nos crains naturels, vraiment en déception, il y a aussi la possibilité donc, de visiter le site de gravure rupestre. Donc imaginez le parc. Au cœur du parc, il y a le site, le site qui est un monument historique, donc qui est protégé davantage. Euh, et quand vous rentrez à l'intérieur du, 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 du site, euh, vous avez une série d'obligations pour la protection de ce site-là. Et donc, vous ne pouvez pas sortir des sentiers sans être accompagné. Il faut suivre un, un sentier qui est obligé. Et euh, tout cela pour protéger ces patrimoines exceptionnels qui pourraient vraiment être en péril, euh, phototourisme de masse ou euh, aux actes de vandalisme qu'on a quand même constaté euh, euh, tout le long de, des années d'ouverture au public. Donc, la première partie, le paysage, avec tous les aspects qui vont avec la formation du paysage, l'évolution du climat jusqu'à nos jours. On présente bien sûr les hommes en ce cas, avec un mannequin hyperréaliste de Homo sapiens proto, comme devait être l'homme qui, qui montait à la vallée des merveilles pour graver sur les roches. Bien sûr, lui aussi inséré dans un contexte d'évolution de, de l'homme. On présente le site dans le cadre du parc, euh, à la fois pour les plus grands et pour les plus petits. On a aussi un parcours enfant qui est destiné aux enfants euh, avec des jeux et avec des explications beaucoup plus simples. Et au centre, la célèbre gravure du sorcier dont je vous parlais tout à l'heure, qui est le symbole de la Vallée des Merveilles et aussi du musée. On parle bien sûr de l'archéologie. Donc, 
la pote histoire avec l'évolution des, des sociétés humaines en partant de la chasse et de la pêche jusqu'à en passant par l'élevage, euh, l'agriculture et après le travail du métal jusqu'à la création des peuples à l'âge du fer. Donc ça c'est notre vision archéologique euh, des hommes avant, durant et après euh, euh, la période de, de gravure. On fait un clin d'œil aussi à l'homme de Similon parce que aussi c'est exactement de la même période que les graveurs de la Vallée des Merveilles. Et après, bien sûr, on a la présentation des gravures. Étant donné qu'on est, on est à Tang, on est à 800 mètres d'altitude, donc on est en contrebas par rapport au site, euh, pour présenter les gravures au, au public, on utilise l'art du moulage. Non, c'est compris présente ces démoulages à l'échelle 1 à 1 en euh, résine et en euh, fibre de verre en tasseau de bois, donc euh, avec euh, de la patine en couleur naturelle en ocre. On présente euh, des dizaines de moulages de gravures à nos visiteurs, de façon qu'ils puissent apprendre l'importance du site, même si euh, à, à plusieurs centaines de mètres de, de, de dénivelé à, à moins. Donc, comme je vous disais, ça, c'est euh, le, le nombre de, de gravures, de gravures qui ont été retrouvées dans la Vallée des Merveilles. Donc, 38 000 pour ce qui concerne la petite histoire, 12 000 pour ce qui concerne l'histoire. Et, euh, et, et c'est parmi euh, les plus importants sites de gravures rupestres des Alpes, euh, de certainement des Alpes, et parmi les plus importants d'Europe avec le Val Camonica. On parle bien sûr de la technique des gravures, ça aussi c'est important, des différentes typologies de gravures que vous retrouvez sur le site, euh, les hypothèses de datation et aussi les interprétations. En ce qui concerne les interprétations, ce n'est pas le musée des merveilles qui va émettre des interprétations euh, très affirmatives, ça veut dire qu'on préfère présenter les différentes interprétations et se baser sur des faits archéologiques. Et donc, dire qu'il s'agissait euh, des lieux euh, très probablement cultuels où les hommes de cette époque gravaient sur la roche les motifs euh, liés à leur vie euh, de tous les jours, donc liés euh, à l'agriculture, à l'élevage et après euh, au travail du métal par la suite. Il est gravé sur les roches pour dialoguer probablement avec euh, des entités autres qui étaient euh, reconnues en tant que divinités. Euh, mais on arrive, et on nous le fait pas de dissocier l'aspect culturel de l'aspect culturel. Donc, euh, on parle tout le temps d'une interprétation qui est vraiment basée sur les faits, sur les faits archéologiques, sur la, les civilisations de cette époque. Et donc, c'est euh, un rapport euh, qui est euh, complètement entremêlé entre la culture de ces populations et euh, le, les cultes que ces populations exprimaient sur les roches. On s'adapte bien sûr à l'évolution aussi de la technique. Depuis quelques années, on fait des campagnes systématiques de photogrammétrie 3D des roches. Donc, on a une base de données d'environ 50 roches positionnées sur une photogrammétrie des deux vallées, de la vallée de Fontanalbe et de la vallée de Mer des Merveilles, euh, avec euh, un défaut au sol très, très limité. On est entre 3 et 7 cm de défaut au sol, pour ce qui concerne la photogrammétrie du site. Et on a plusieurs survols en drone des grandes dalles gravées. Donc, imaginez une base de données euh, vraiment euh, très importante euh, avec euh, la modélisation du territoire, Vallée des Merveilles, Vallée de Fontanalbe, des grandes dalles et d'une cinquantaine de roches et tout cela qui dialogue euh, ensemble. Donc, ça fait partie, euh, j'imagine, de l'une des de bases de données les plus, euh, là aussi, les plus importantes d'Europe. Donc là, c'est les différentes typologies de captation qu'on a utilisées. Donc, bien sûr, celui euh, euh, pédestre par terre, après le drone et après l'ULM pour la captation euh, du territoire. Et cela, bien sûr, c'est pour nous un, un outil de médiation. Donc, on l'a introduit aussi dans le musée pour le présenter aux visiteurs. À la fois, le 3D, c'est ce qui est pour nous, en tant que musée, c'est bien sûr un outil de recherche et un outil pour le chercheur, mais aussi euh, un outil de divulgation et de médiation vis-à-vis hein, -vis de nos visiteurs. Donc là, c'est encore des aperçus du musée avec euh, le rôle de la montagne au centre du site, les différents chercheurs qui ont visité le musée, euh, excusez-moi, qui ont fréquenté le site et qui ont parlé du site au cours des siècles. 
Après, euh, ça c'est la nouveauté aussi dans cette nouvelle scénographie, c'est le fait d'insérer le bégo dans l'ensemble de l'art rupestre dans le monde. Donc, de le contextualiser, le monde bégo, ça fait partie de ce phénomène que vous connaissez très bien, vous en faites partie euh, comme Ifrao, euh, de sites de gravures rupestres qui sont parsemés un peu partout dans le monde. Donc, on parle de technique, on parle de datation, on parle aussi de, de thématique. Et on dit bien que le bégo fait partie d'une... De, 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 euh, d'une attitude humaine qu'on retrouve partout dans le monde de graver ou de peindre dans les roches depuis euh, la préhistoire. Et en même temps, euh, ce phénomène qui est un phénomène mondial est un phénomène qui est aussi très territorial, comme partout dans le monde. Et donc, on exprime au Bégo le, 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 la culture qui était propre de notre territoire alpin, euh, déjà à partir du néolithique. Après, bien sûr, on ne parle pas seulement de la gravure proto-historique, mais on parle aussi des gravures historiques. Et c'est là où on met les gravures historiques dans un contexte d'histoire du territoire. Et comme je disais tout à l'heure, c'est des gravures de marins, de bergers, de voyageurs lettrés, de soldats. Mais surtout, surtout, surtout des gravures de bergers. Donc, les bergers qui sont caractéristiques de, de, de ces territoires, qui est un territoire de frontière depuis toujours. Et donc, on termine dans le musée en parlant vraiment de, de ces hommes de frontière qui euh, sont là depuis euh, la fin de la glaciation et qui ont laissé les traces donc, de leur vie et de leurs espoirs, de leur culte sur les roches de la Vallée des Merveilles, dans un contexte territorial qui est un contexte territorial qui a eu euh, une histoire tout à fait particulière, comme tout toutes les zones de frontières et qui est encore aujourd'hui une tradition qui est une tradition euh, typique des, des gens qu'on appelle de l'entre-deux. Comme je vous disais tout à l'heure, on tient tout particulièrement à diffuser la, les informations concernant le bégo aussi à nos visiteurs les plus petits, donc on fait énormément de médiation vis-à-vis -vis des, des enfants et on n'oublie pas tout ce qui est merchandising avec euh, une boutique qui est très riche en produits dérivés, euh, logotisés, euh, Musée des Merveilles, avec euh, la mise en valeur des gravures euh, du Mont Bégo euh, sur des euh, centaines, centaines, centaines d'objets. Je vous disais, on a quand même un public entre 20 000 et 35 000 visiteurs par an et euh, le but, c'est vraiment de faire connaître les gravures rupestres et aussi contribuer à, au respect envers les gravures rupestres. Je termine en fin avec les deux expositions qu'on est en train d'exposer ces jours-ci. Euh, Jusqu'à la fin de l'année, on travaille sur les minières. Donc, on, on parle de mines euh, au Musée des Merveilles. C'est une minière qui est à quelques kilomètres de chez nous, de plan argentifère. C'est une euh, mine qui est vraiment... Euh, Très, très intéressante euh, et qui peut être visitée à partir de cette année. Et là, c'est l'exposition qu'on a présentée au musée pour nos visiteurs et pour les inciter à aller découvrir le territoire, à aller visiter la mine. Et après, on a décliné tout cela aussi avec une recherche sur les petits mineurs des Alpes, pourquoi les... les... Pourquoi Blanche-Neige et les sept nains Et donc, euh, toute une histoire sur les légendes qui se créent autour des petits mineurs euh, qui partaient de Venise vers l'Europe du centre pour aller à la recherche des minéraux précieux à partir de la Renaissance et jusqu'à la création des légendes et, et après à, à la toute dernière création de Blanche-Neige et les sept nains. Je finis enfin en vous disant que tout cela, on l'a fait malgré euh, une catastrophe qui nous a touchés en octobre 2020 parce qu'une tempête, une tempête, excusez-moi, vraiment catastrophique, a détruit 50 km de route et beaucoup d'habitations. Il y a eu aussi des morts. Et donc, on vient de récupérer à peine le lien avec la côte et on n'a pas du tout encore le lien avec le Piémont italien. Donc, on tient à, à, à faire connaître le musée, à faire connaître notre patrimoine, surtout en ce moment, au vu des difficultés d'approche, de, de, vraiment, les difficultés de se rendre chez nous en ce moment, euh, suite à cette catastrophe. Donc, euh, il travaille, tout le monde travaille beaucoup pour que la normalité revienne vers nous. Et donc, euh, je vous invite, je vous invite à découvrir notre patrimoine et, et bien sûr, je vous attends au Musée des Merveilles à Tende. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for this very interesting presentation. And now we go to Mila Simoes de Abreu, Rock Art Research in Portugal, the last five years. Uh, Mila is uh, the president of the Portuguese Rock Art Association. 
Well, uh, I'm also a member of the Centro Camun and the cooperative. So. Yeah, too much, too many things. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with all of you here, the ones that are listened now and the ones that probably will listen later because of the time difference. Uh, you know, we are one hour advance uh, um, uh, earlier than, than uh, Italy, but many of you, I can see the ones that are in China probably will be already late afternoon or even night. So good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Uh, in fact, you know, it's five years that we meet some some of us, all of uh, some of the, the, the our associations of IFRAO in Valcamonica in 2018. And in Portugal, like in many of your countries, I guess, we these five years had uh, been um, tough, shall I say. Um, the pandemic also uh, affects us. We are a very small country that, uh, uh, as you know, uh, most of you know, uh, leave a lot of tourism and also of our uh, exports of wine and cork. Uh, and so the economy suffer a lot. And uh, when we talk about research, sometimes these two elements are important. So we lost most of our visitors. We had no visitors for a period of time because we were locked down no? and uh, the economy suffer and so it's been very tough for us as researchers to um, this some of some of these uh, um, years but it's the situations change I would say dramatically in uh, in a good sense and so what I'm presenting to you today it's in fact the five years in terms of research and what we have new I, I would like, uh, and by the way, salute Valeria and Paolo that are there in Valcamonica. I think they they are going to show my PowerPoint. Otherwise, I can try to show it from here, but I send it to them. Is it like that? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Good. So uh, you know, Portugal uh, for many for many years, I would say till the the last decade of the 20th century was not known as a, a important uh, rock art country shall we say the quantity of uh, in fact the studies the researchers and the sites that uh, we uh, were known was was very very little now or practically nothing and this is the reason why for example i went to study rock art in in italy uh, and I spent some time there and travel uh, and work around the world. I never thought that there was anything interesting here in Portugal until in 1994, I was surprised by um, the discover or uh, we, we realized that in fact, the country was uh, rich of rock art. And this start, and I can show you the next slide maybe. Um, next, next, next. Okay, so my, many of you that are here with me today participate in what uh, was uh, what we call a fight to save the Coa. The Coa was a is a valley in the north of Portugal, a tributary of the of the Coa Valley, and where the Portuguese government through this electric uh, electric uh, company, uh, then it was a state company, was building a very huge dam. And during the construction, uh, we, we came to the knowledge of the, the area as a, a, an important rock art site. And so Angelo, Andrea, uh, uh, Robert Bednerik, and many of the uh, researchers from IFRAO had the opportunity to go there and visit and, and assess that the rail, really it was an important uh, area and that the dam that was planning shouldn't go ahead. Fortunately, and if Rao play an enormous role on this, and I never stop um, telling this, but during the 12 months uh, of this campaign, we managed to convince the, the, the Portuguese government that abandoned the, the construction of this dam. The person that you have in the, this black and or white photograph in the middle was the then prime minister that uh, gave the, you know, this final redict and stop the dam. And today is the is the Secretary of State of the United Nations. So he made a very good career. So that means that sometimes having the courage of doing the right things, it's good for you, even for your career. So Antonio Guterres, it was a supporter of 
uh, of the engravings from the beginning, the campaign, uh, then known as the engravings cannot uh, uh, swim, as gravuras não sabem nadar. Uh, many of you uh, participate, wrote letters, and uh, and it was very important for, for us as rock art researchers because stopping the dam was really the beginning of a completely new era for rock art. And I must say today, Portugal is probably one of the richest countries in, in the world in terms of uh, size uh, and proportion to the size better of, of rock art. Can, I, can we see the next one? Uh, and, and it's very e uh, easy to see this in, this, in, in these three maps. So this is a, a map of Portugal and in, two, in 1929, when it was made the first inventory, you could see that there was very few uh, sites in 1942. There were a bit more in the north. And this is the, um, the map uh, um, of the corpus of the rock art uh, uh, in, published in 2012 that we made. And uh, this map shows the, not only the concentration uh, of, that is now uh, practically in uh, every par par part of the country, but also that, yes, the north of the Portugal continues to be uh, uh, the area where we have more um, rock uh, uh, engraved and paintings. Uh, we have now more than 750 sites. Of course, when I say sites, this is a bit uh, maybe confusing to what it really means, but you know, usually we consider, consider a site that has uh, uh, engravings and paintings, and some of them can have thousands of them. So in terms of numbers, we are talking ab about thousands of, of uh, image that were made uh, during uh, a long period of time, starting with the end of the Upper Paleolithic till our days, because there are some cases of also here, like in Montebago, of more recent rock art. Uh, next one. Um, when we talk about rock art in Portugal, usually we talk more we we talk more about uh, um, uh, engravings, and these are the the type of engravings that we used to know, and that are still very common. Uh, in many of the, the, the rock art sites. That means cup marks, concentric circles. Sometimes we have some zoomorphic figures, some animal figures, and of course we have other kind of symbols. All of them were not very exciting, I, I must say, you know, uh, uh, but there is no doubt that uh, the discover of the rock art of the COA put in the map put in the map of Portugal and especially transform it uh, Portugal in the one of the countries with the, the highest concentration of Paleolithic style um, engravings, uh, very few paintings, but they are uh, um, in the open air. And this was really what the COA uh, means to, to the research of the rock art in the world. So we, we from the discover of the core and the study of the core, we realized that the rock art, the Paleolithic rock art was not only in caves, like we uh, used to know in France and in Spain, but also in the open. And so we also realized that like in many other countries in the world, probably, you know, our, uh, our ancestors were making rock art both inside, in caves and also outside. And, you know, conservation and preservation is a big problem. And so we are conscious that what we have today is a small portion, what exists and what uh, uh, was made by our ancestors. Um, next one, please. The, the next. Okay. In, in relation to the paintings, the country is not very, very rich. As you can see, there's a, a huge difference between the map of the engravings and the map of uh, the paintings, but they are, again, concentrated in the north uh, of Portugal. And in the last years, I must say that probably is exactly among this kind of art that more discoveries are being made. Especially because as it happens, usually, you know, more you are, uh, your eyes get used to you, to it, more you understand what you should look and where you should look, more you find. And uh, the research and prospection and, you know, survey is exactly that, is to go to the field and sometimes in places that are well known, discover things that you didn't realize. Um, in the case of the paintings, we have only one cave with paintings, most of, of our paintings are in the open, uh, are rock shelters like that, or even walls. And uh, this includes several sites 
and this is the ones that you have the picture and the uh, and the map shows exactly that several sites with paintings are also known in the Koa Valley so when people talk about the 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 engravings of the Koa Valley we should really uh, uh, have in mind that there are also paintings and sometimes even both in the same panel. So it's more really uh, the generic term for this case. Uh, next, next one, next one. Okay, so when when we first saw the first engravings in the in the Koa, the rocks were thirty. I can tell you that now, so almost 30 years have passed, we know that there are in fact 1,300 rocks with the engravings. So it was an amazing, in terms of percentage, imagine what this, this means. So the, the dam was stopped knowing very few sites and now there are close to 80 sites with thousands of, of image and with uh, a large number, as I, as I told you, of almost uh, uh, 1,300 rocks. And the, the, the continuous research shows that we still have probably um, many other sites to found around in the Doro uh, area, especially in the Koa. The Koa is a tributary, as I told you, of the, of, uh, of the Koa. But in the uh, first decade of the 20th century, several sites, Paleolithic sites, were also discovered in other rivers like for example the Sabo river, the Tua river and the Agada, Agda river. So um, bringing to our mind that probably we are not talking about the area of the core but maybe we should talk about the Doro, the, the basin of the Doro because there are sites also on the other side or in Spain, in our neighbor. Uh, the the Koa is a World Heritage Site since 1998, together now with Ciega Verde that is in, in Spain. So it's a World Heritage Site with the two countries. And exactly because we understand that now the, the rock is a bit, uh, has no frontiers. There were no frontiers in prehistoric time. And so we have in both, both countries. The map shows you the density that we have today of uh, of sites in the in the Koa, and many of these sites are uh, still being studied, and so that's why I'm going to show you a couple of things that are related with the Koa and also other areas in in the country. Next one. Okay, so uh, just before uh, we had the talk about the Montebago and the importance, for example, of the museum. Uh, after in 2010, uh, the museum, uh, it was inaugurated a museum in Coa Valley. Of course, the visitors and research study continues uh, was alive before that, but there's no doubt that the presence of, of this museum Museum that is uh, was opened uh, um, as an introduction, shall we say, to the public, to the tourists, made a big change. Now, tourists now are uh, usually what they do is that they come and visit the museum, have an introduction, and after they go and see one or two rock art sites. Unfortunately, uh, we have very few sites on the core that are still open to the public. Um, there are three main sites that are open and periodical other sites are sometimes, uh, is, it, is, it po is possible to visit. The, 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 the museum is in a very beautiful place and uh, the architects try to make it in a way that uh, is really integrated with the uh, with landscape. Go ahead, can we see the next one? So you can have an idea. Uh, for the ones that know the Koa, this is uh, the, the museum was implemented, was constructed above three little valleys on the Douro, that uh, mainly Vermelhosa, that Andrea Angel study with me. So today, is it possible to go and visit the museum? And as you can see, go down and see, and see Ver Vermelhosa. The museum itself, next one as in the case of the Montebago, uh, use all the technology and uh, we, today we have uh, is available a series of things that we can improve the, um, the shall we say, the, the way that visitors uh, can uh, uh, interact with the, the, the subject. Uh, the museum is also uh, um, prepared uh, to uh, have researchers there. Is, there is the research center that uh, um, is in the building and a very nice library. 
and and has even a you know a shop and a restaurant all 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 these things that today museums have and also temporary exhibitions and these temporary exhibitions are have been very important very successful because this makes the the visitors wanted to go to the museum more than once because they know that they have something new there to see uh, and this include not only things related with the other sites of uh, prehistoric sites, rock art sites, but also contemporary art and other things, what makes, I think, very enjoyable uh, and appealing the, the uh, visiting the, the center. The site is so nice and, and people feel so happy there that they even organize weddings, imagine. That. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. Can, can we go on, please, next one? So you'll see a bit of the, the interior. And exactly like in Montebago, the uh, rock art is difficult to present in museums. Usually you cannot cut pieces of, or you shouldn't at least cut and take it, remove it. But fortunately today you have these uh, copies that are very, very well done and that they reproduce the, can reproduce very well the, the engravings, including, as you can see in one of the pictures, including the very fine filiforms that were very difficult in, in the past to be to to have a reproduction. Of here. But these are quite uh, uh, close to the reality. And even if you, so you don't have the opportunity to go and see the sites, even visiting, I think the museum is already a very good experience. There is a part dedicated, of course, to the archaeological context and uh, with some of uh, the results of some of the excavations excavations that have been done in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, uh, next one. Okay. So and, uh, there was an effort also to uh, prepare the environment the way that uh, visitors can be easier for visitors to go and see the rock art themselves. And, and so today, for example, from uh, the museum of... Um, up in the museum of uh, the Koa, you can go down and visit Vermelhosa, Andre Arca. You know that, that this is possible, not the way that we used to work when, when it was very difficult for us. No? You can reach some of the sites using the kayak and boats, and they even has, there is even a, a solar boat that is completely silenced and that can take the visitors to go and see most of the rock art sites. I, I would say that after the initial impact of the first years where the managing of the site was not to my opinion, uh, well done. I must say that in recent years, there was a very big improvement. And so um, visitors are very welcomed and I think they can enjoy the visit. And this is the reason why uh, we have we have numbers that are absolute, absolutely extraordinary because last year we had 80,000 80, visitors. And um, um, this February, uh, there was the record of uh, la the larger number of visitors in one day with 800 visitors. And this was in the winter. So you can imagine what uh, really this means for the local economy and uh, how really people understand that we were right when we asked to stop the dam and to save the uh, the save the core. Of course, there is a long lots of things to do. There's lots of work to be done. The, uh, you need to improve lots of things, especially the way that people reach the core because core is uh, in the interior of Portugal, so far away, four or five hours from Lisbon or two or three hours from Porto. So this is something that we uh, still, I think we need to work on it. But on the other hand, we don't want to transform the core in a massive place with thousands of people that they cannot enjoy. We want the visitor to be there to and to learn, to enjoy. And this is an experience that cannot be multiplied for thousands of millions of people. And we must be careful about that. And, you know, uh, as you can imagine, governments and local authorities and even local entrepreneurs sometimes push uh, a bit um, all over the world, the numbers, they want more visitors and this can have an impact in the preservation and the cons conservation of rock art. Go ahead, next one. Uh, uh, next. Okay, so what we have, what are the big news in the in the COA? The research, as I told you, continues, and this research is being uh, um, mainly you now focused on sort of continuous the survey, continuous identifying and recording uh, the image and. Uh, uh, last year, in 2022, this uh, um, figure was discovered. It's now the largest figures that, figure that exists in 
the uh, uh, it's an auroch, um, an ancient bull, with more than three meters and a half. So it's very, very large, almost uh, larger than the actual than the actual animal, probably. And in some of these discoveries are very important because they are being made uh, in, with the, uh, rocks with panels that are under the earth, and so it's been possible to date some of this. Uh, Stratigraphy and the, and this, of course, in terms of chronology, is extremely is extremely impo important. I must say that some rocks are still under the water because there was a previous dam, and so some areas of the core, Fariseu itself, this one here, is sometimes is flooded. And in the winter, when it rains a lot, even Ribera de Piscos, one of the first ones that was discovered, is and Panescosa can be under the water. So there is there is uh, we are worried about the preservation and how to deal how to deal with this. Next one. Um, so the, from the largest uh, figure in the core to the smallest one, because, and this was a completely a novelty, something that was extraordinary in the, in the last years of the 20th century, we, they were identified already several um, pieces of rock, so uh, uh, sections, and sometimes they are part of the wall itself, sometimes they are not. And these words were excavated in, in Fariseu. Uh, as you can see, the, the map shows you that portable art is not very common in Portugal, like in, for example, in Germany or, or even in France or Spain. Uh, it's very rare, but the records were, uh, Croa broke all the records. There is more than a uh, hundred uh, of these um, uh, plaquettes that were being discovered in the Croa. And in the uh, first years of the century, uh, in the other valley, um, the um, Sabor Valley, across the, the north of the, the river Douro, uh, also during the construction of another dam, they were found more than 50 plaquettes. These plaquettes are being studied. Most of them are with images that correspond and very similar with the ones that we find in the panels in vertical, so in the rocks outside. What are they? It, it's very difficult to explain what were their models of what they were going to reproduce, for example, in the large, um, in, we don't know. The interesting is that, uh, and I think Angelo and Andre will like this one, the interesting is that there is also Iron Age portable art and you have a, an interesting uh, scene uh, in the lower part of the, of the picture. So this tradition is not only a Paleolithic tradition, it's a tradition in fact that continues for a long period of time. And so now in the core, not only we need to look to all vertical surface, but we, ne we need also to look to the floor where uh, we know that now we could have rocks with, uh, with, in with engravings. Next one. Mila, say uh, in retard. Okay. Un, un okay. minuto. Eh, mamma, Dio, dai. <laughs> okay, last time, dai. Giusto per tutti. Ok, ok, lasciami passare. Eh, eh, de, ah. Mi passate subito le diapositive, dai. Angelo? Angelo? Un momento. Scusa Mila, ho fatto casino io, tranquilla. Eh, dai. Lasciatemi, datemi almeno cinque minuti perché ho perso un po' di, di tempo a aspettare le diapositive, dai. Ok, next one, voilà, next one, very quickly. Ok, uh, ok, these two slides are, uh, are very recent discoveries that were made of these uh, small uh, stones that uh, can be found uh, not only near the walls, but uh, all, all over the place. Next one, next one, ok, next. Next, next one, next one. Okay, some of this. Next one. Okay, but it was not only in the core that we have some news and some discoveries. This is in Ocreza, it is another valley with uh, rock art that had one, only one horse, a horse with Paleolithic, uh, in Paleolithic style. If we show the next one, you can see that there is uh, um, novelties in that uh, area too, because there was another panel 
Right. With the engravings that uh, paleolithic engravings that it was it was also found. So it was not an isolated case. The the horse of Ocresa is probably part of a larger, very larger complex. Uh, next one, very quickly. This one I need to show. I need to show to you. Uh, in, in, I was talking about paintings, and then when I in the beginning I was telling that there's all these rock shelters. This is an area called Serra de Passos that has the largest concentration of rock shelters with a, a hundred rock shelters painting. And and just recent, few months ago, we went back. We had a, almost a kind of nightmare. Next one, because we found that the the local municipality, with the support of a, a, an engineering company. Next one, you know, this is the, the paintings of this area. Next one, they they were doing nothing else than a, a wind windmill farm on top of the of the of the uh, paintings uh, sites. And so we start a campaign. <laughs> this time, as pinturas don't have a voir, you know, the paintings cannot fly. <laughs> and 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 uh, and we start a campaign to save this uh, this site also. And uh, next one, you know, I can show a little bit of the. This is the area, and the, in red is the wind farms. I know that this is something that many colleagues around the world are today fighting against: is with these windmills. And most uh, in Spain and in many in Brazil, in many countries in the world, we have this. We have this uh, ecological, this greenwash that you know the governments on pose of us and that in some are uh, in rock art areas that suffer and, and we need to fight this and join efforts next one next one next one okay so if frau had a role a very important role you can see the facsimiles of the letter that uh, angel wrote almost immediately in our request and this letter together with some of the uh, different um, uh, conference and uh, talks and uh, visits that we made with local people and uh, with others around the world had an enormous impact. And so I'm, I'm extremely pleased, and I think we, I should uh, really um, finish like that, to tell you that uh, uh, the letter was sent in October next, last year, 2022. Let's go and see the next uh, uh, slide. And uh, just one month ago, the court stopped the building of this uh, uh, building. So once more, Ifrau contribute to saving an uh, um, uh, important site. Next one, next one. Next one. No. No. Okay, so uh, we are we are very pleased to tell you that the rock art uh, site of Passos, of Serra de Passos, with something like a, a, a hundred uh, panels, painted panels, will be probably safe and uh, we managed to stop this the construction of this uh, 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 of this windmill. Uh, I think uh, uh, after a period of time that we all of us had other problems, I think we should join again uh, uh, efforts around the world and do like that. What Ifra was and is, I think, very important to uh, disseminate the rock art research, to contribute to new studies, but especially to help each other. So if you have any problem, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Ifra and you can be sure that all of us around the world will support you. Grazie Mila, thank you very much for this very interesting and successful presentation. And now we give room to Laurien Bruno and Annie Danielian uh, of the Paris University School of Iatic uh, Studies, a new standardized data set for Himalayan rock. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. I hope you, you can listen properly and uh, let me know if it's not the case. Uh, so good afternoon, Annie, Danelian and myself will introduce today our current team research project uh, on Himalayan rock art. First, we would like to address our sincere gratitude to Professor Fossati for his invitation to present our researches at the IFRA Inter Congress Symposium today online. And I'm, I, I am also pleased, very pleased to see online and uh, Jiraj Kumar, the president of the Rock Art Society of India, with whom I have not met in person for many years. As you see on the screen, and the partic particularity of our project is to deal with the Himalayas as a whole, 
geographically and culturally, despite the current political division of this high altitude mountainous region over northern Pakistan, northern India, and West Nepal. Excavations in the Himalayan region, all periods combined, can be counted on the figures on the fingers of both ends. Archaeological, archaeological research relies mainly on the analysis of surface material. Next slide, please. Over the last 50 years, rock art proved to be a very valuable source by its quantity, diversity, and immobility to understand the past of the Himalayas, from prehistoric to Buddhist times, that is to say from the fifth millennium BC to the, uh, the start of the second millennium uh, CE. After being solely the concerns of a few since, it, since its discovery at the end of the 19th century, the awareness of the scientific significance of and heritage importance of Himalayan rock art rose dramatically over the last decade. Although rock art documentation is still sometimes carried out individually, various team initi initiatives driven by actors with diverse backgrounds, such as heritage NGOs, rock art enthusiasts, and academics, have recently emerged at the national, regional, and international levels. Though we can only praise this recent interest, it is to be regretted that these various initiatives often result in rather than data, whereas many rock art sites face imminent threat of damage or destruction. In worst cases, the data is of little use because it cannot be processed scientifically. Very often, it consists in out-of-context photographs of petroglyphs reporting the existence of a rock art site. In best cases, the data collected is not comparable because every initiative follows its own system, preventing a comprehensive study, not only at the Himalayan scale, but also within a subregion. Therefore, an effort was to be made to build a standardized data set. This painstaking step is the necessary condition to provide a coherent framework for interpreting Himalayan rock art in the future and better characterize Himalayan culture or cultures. In order to be useful, past and future data must be homogenized following a precise method that is complying to inter international standards in rock art studies, as well as tailor to the Himalayas. In light of this, commitments have been undertaken in the frame of the current research program, Himalayan Archaeology, Material Culture and Ancient Networks. The first output of the, is the, sorry, is the Himalayan rock art database called Hirada in short. And the second output consists in a handbook for rock art documentation in the Himalayas. Both outputs rest on three pillars that are research, preservation, and accessibility, and are designed according to current standards in open science and digital humanities. And the fact that a field work was not accessible over the last few years uh, reinforced or focused on these two outputs. Before presenting in details the content of the dataset itself, let me state that the core collection, composed of original data gathered in Ladakh in northern India, over two decades by my colleague, by my colleague Martin Bernier and myself, whether separately or together in the field was used as proof of concept. With the objectives, as you can see, of homogenization and making it uh, publicly accessible. For Hirada, we retained a multi-scale approach recording the location, as you can see on the screen, the support uh, and the art composed of the motif and the scene. This multi-scale approach implies the contributions of several disciplines, such as, but not only, geomorphology, geology, anthropology, archaeology, zoology, art history, paleography, etc. As you see, the dataset is composed in ascending proportionality of spatial, visual, and written data. The written data is 20 times more important than visual items. All are linked by a unique object identifier that consists in a code created that matches the multi-scale approach, location, support, and art. 
Looking first at the spatial data, uh, you can see that 224 rock art sites were geolocalized. 89 have been systematically documented, 42 have been surveyed, and, and the existence of, haba, of about 100 more rock art sites has been reported. Concerning the visual data, it consists in aerial views, maps, sketches, tracings, but uh, mainly photographs and only a very few uh, photogrammetric uh, models. The whole visual data is being published online on, onto a public digital platform it, uh, that is called Nakala. It enables viewing rock art sites in their totality, respecting the multi-scale approach. As you can see, about 15,000 items will be publicly available, sorry, available at the end of June 23, so in about one month, and will be freely reusable. All items will be accessible through different collections, whether you are interested into a particular region, site, scale, location, support, or art, or type of image, whether tracing, area views, sketches, photographs, etc. In order to describe such a large amount of data, we developed a teaser specific to Himalayan rock art. It draws upon previous efforts of standardization in the field of rock art studies in general and Himalayan rock art in particular, whether published or unpublished. The teaser was published online a couple of months ago and it reflects the three main concepts of the multiscolar approach that, again, location, support, and art. The thesaurus consists of hierarchies, definitions, and illustrations of 350 terms or concepts. For example, on the left of the screen, it's not really uh, readable, uh, but uh, you have the example of uh, the try to guess on the screen. Uh, in the zone of branch is the yak that is emblematic of Himalayan rock art. As you can see on the screenshot on the right, um, it displays, uh, the term yak displays not only its hierarchy, broader concept and related concepts, enabling a detailed description, but also provides a precise definition and an illustration showing the diversity of yaks uh, represented in the rock art of the Himalayas. Finally, a stable digital link enables others to reuse the concept for description of their own data set. For instance, the thesaurus will be applied by colleagues, uh, by Canadian and Pakistani colleagues acquiring a 3D rock art data set in northern Pakistan in the frame of their own project. Practically, the standardized description of the data is entered into spreadsheets respecting entries of the thesaurus. We would like now to present an overview of scenes into Himalayan rock art. One very important contribution to Hirada was carried out by Annie Danelian in the frame of our post postdoctoral research that we she will now present to you. Thank you, Loria. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, the main objective of my research was to identify, analyze, and classify the scenes in the Hirada database. A total of 89 rock art sites consisting of 141 zones were the subject of this study. These sites have been systematically documented in the field, and they all have information at different levels following Hirada multi-scale documentation system, as you, as you can see on the slide. In total, this represents the treatment of 16,804 uh, motifs. 1,461 rock art scenes have been identified, analyzed, classified, and recorded in the database following Hirada's terminology and codification system. It should be noted that there is little agreement on the definition of a scene among rock art specialists. We have opted for the following definition, which takes into account several criteria. The term scene designates the interaction or association of two motifs minimum. As each documentation level, scenes have also two types of fields in the database, 
a referencing field, which indicates the scene code and two textual fields, scene identification and comments, as well as each scene has a visual documentation. Each scene has been identified according to 14 values listed uh, here below. If necessary, additional information relating to a given uh, scene has been added in free text in the field scene comments reserved for this purpose. This additional information allows, for example, to find a remarkable scene identified as other because of its rarity or multiplicity of possible identifications. According to the first results of statistical analysis, the rock art scenes are divided in decreasing order as follows. Hunt, group, other, image and text, pair, predation, domestication, ceremonial, confrontation, mating, duel, and battle scenes. Apart from the scenes identified as image and text, which refer mostly without doubt to the historical period, the main identified scenes evoke different aspects of animal life as group, predation, confrontation, mating scenes, and human activities, which are often ritualized and linked to the animal world. For example, hunting, ceremonial, and domestication scenes. The other interesting point is that this rock art seems to represent for the most part wild animals and hunting scenes. Yet for a variety of reasons, this art is dated to the proto-historical period or later, during which time we presume that the economy could be based principally on agriculture and pasture lease, as in surrounding regions. In this case, the social context of the rock art wouldn't be straightforwardly a representation of the daily activities of the people who made it. It's also important to note that it is, this is not a narrative art in the normative sense of this term, as these representations don't seem to relate specific stories or events. They often suggest scenes through the choice of attributes as weapons, tools, disguises, and or through their attitudes. In this sense, these images allude less to acts than to ideas. For example, the representation of a sword tends to assimilate the anthropomorphic figures who carry it to warriors, and in this way to evoke a battle scene as here. However, it can signify power, domination, without necessarily referring to a, a warlike event. Moreover, the ideas or activities to which these scenes refer are not always so distinct. For example, uh, the depictions of archers seemingly ready to shoot their arrows at each other suggest a duel or a battle scene, while the bow and arrow refer more to the hunting work. Thus the weapons of hunting and battle and consequently the corresponding scenes are not clearly differentiated in this imagery. Moreover, the representations of archers or warriors could evoke hunting and battle scenes as well as ceremonial scenes in which these motives would be the main actors. Thus, in the absence of iconographic details and external references as text ethnographic data, we have to admit that there are many limits to the proper identification of scenes in rock art. Moreover, it's often impossible to prove association of motives rather than simple juxtaposition. Nevertheless, we can advance that the main meaning that emanates from this rock art with selective subjects is the human domination and appropriation of the animal world. The established identifications enable us to highlight on the one hand the diversity and on the other a certain standardization of the scenes, both thematically and stylistically. It shows that these images obey to certain graphic canons and probably correspond to a transmitted knowledge, which tends to indicate a social significance of this rock art. These first elements of analysis are encouraging and confirm the relevance of the developed research tool. Further analytical results are expected with the finalization of Hirada database in a few months. For example, this system can enable the visualization and analysis of spatial distribution of different categories of rock art scenes within each site and on a regional scale and help to better understand the logic of their distribution. Please, Loria. Indeed, the next stage of Yes, thank you, Annie. Indeed, the next stage of ERADA is a public release of a website proposing a GIS and a search engine and enhancing future research and fulfilling its promises of accessibility and preservation. 
We will also provide a copy of the data set to national repositories in India, Pakistan, and Nepal in the future, as well as to any organization making the request. We are also thinking, thinking about ways of making the data set usable without being dependent from internet because connectivity is a daily issue in the Himalayas. Any exemplified research carried out on 89 record sites documented in a systematic manner. But we have seen, here, but, uh, we have seen that Hirada also provides information on record sites that were surveyed or reported on me. In the Himalayas, record is not subject to looting, but to damages and destruction due to rapidly growing development works. So we made the choice to display publicly their localization in order to encourage their systematic documentation. In order to do so also, we propose a step-by-step -step handbook for record documentation in the Himalayas. To be published in open access by the end of next year, the handbook describes a method to gather reliable, special, visual, and written information in the field. In order to make it user-friendly, it displays an illustrated glossary enabling to fill in, uh, to fill in field record forms that we designed in accordance with the multi-scale approach and the thesaurus. The handbook makes the method accessible to archaeology students, independent researchers, and rock art enthusiasts, so that anyone can, con can contribute to the documentation of this valuable Himalayan cultural heritage. Collaborators working in India and Pakistan already tested a draft version of the handbook. They helped improve it and now contribute to Irada. Of course, we strongly wish that Irada will become a collaborative project, but in any case, its open link data policy ensures its compatibility with other digital humanities initiatives, not only in the field of Himalayan archaeology and rock art studies, but also with other projects currently being developed on the iconography and epigraphy of, of, of South Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorian and uh, Annie, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, now uh, we have the, uh, some minutes for a discussion. So if anybody that is uh, the researchers that are online with us, but also people from the YouTube uh, uh, presentation uh, can uh, ask uh, questions. Uh, hello, everyone, and it was a good day also. Uh, as uh, it is the first time after five years after the uh, Darfo that we are meeting here. So good to see so many friends here. Uh, I, I have certain queries, not the uh, questions to Andrea. Uh, have you found any implement used for production of rock art? And uh, this, uh, this is the one question because a lot of petroglyphs have been discovered there in your area. And uh, to ask Sandron, uh, because uh, she has uh, very well uh, this, uh, presented the exhibition in the museum. So the same, if, if in the museum uh, has any display of this, the, uh, the implements used for the production of rock art. Now this is the um, Lauriani and Churchill, uh, because they are working in the Himalayas and uh, very much interesting to me also. <clears throat> Have you, uh, while this the calculating this, the percentage of the figures and the motifs, activities, have you considered the effect of the taponomy on this, the 
surface and the survival of uh, this the rock art motifs there okay too many questions <laughs> <Giri Raj. laughs> thank you start uh, let's start with andrea and silvia no no capito nice. Chiede, chiede se eh, abbiamo trovato nei, nelle nostre ricerche delle, ehm, degli strumenti per produrre le incisioni di questo. Um, one time, one time in 35 years, perhaps other, but uh, at uh, Grosio Rupe Magna, uh, it was found in a fixture in a hole of the rock, a quartz stone mm. like these dimensions. Um, with a point, so it was utilized for making engravings. But normally, uh, Valta Monica and Valtellina, quite all the engravings are making by packing, so it was uh, an, a, an instrument. Um, maybe uh, Communion Center of Prehistory Study did the same in other, on other rocks. No, no, have, you, you have been excavating the sites also. So in, in the excavation, uh, also you could not get the implements? No, we don't start the, the digging because it's a, a, an activity related to archaeological superintendency. Uh, when we find something, it's because the rocks are covered by 10 or 20 centimeters of uh, ground of grass. Uh, and sometimes inside the fixtures of, of, of the rock, uh, there is something left. Once uh, was found this, this uh, pegging tool, one other time was found an elytic axe and some uh, pottery. But uh, it's very, it's rare, it's obviously not common. We also discovered some colors, for example. We have colors uh -huh. that are being abandoned near to the rocks. Mm -hmm. Silvia, I don't know if Silvia is online. Mm -hmm. Silvia, okay. Si. No, it's bon, je suis là. Silvia chiede se, se sono stati trovati strumenti per produrre le incisioni rupestri vicino alle rocce o durante scavi. Uh, allora, diciamo non in correlazione diretta. Si suppone che sia stato utilizzato del quarzo reperibile sul sito, ma non c'è correlazione diretta, nel senso che non è che è stato trovato durante uno scavo e quindi è possibile datarne l'utilizzo. Mm. So they, they, they didn't find the direct... Uh witness of uh, the, the, the tools that uh, were used, but uh, because they didn't do uh, the excavations. And you must uh, remember that the Mount Vego, the stratigraphy near to the rocks uh, is very shallow because it's uh, in very high altitude. So usually you find some uh, uh, quartz, uh, quartz uh, yeah, made of quartz uh, tools uh, near to the rocks, but not directly into excavations. Yes, also when uh, there's been some um, excavation also in, uh, in Fort Pedinadro, they found some pebbles, something that can be similar to a, uh, let's say, sort of hammer, but uh, it's nothing that can be uh, directly related to the engravings and can have a specific uh, signs of use uh, for the packing. So, so far we can only uh, say hypothetically, uh, that are the instruments, the tools use it, but we don't have a scientific, let's say, a uh, connection between them. Yeah. Uh, Anati, Anati <laughs> found uh, during the excavation of the uh, uh, pit test uh, near the Chemo boulders, some of these uh, tools that were probably used uh, to, to make the, to produce the engravings. And in Luine? Also in Luine. So but maybe it requires some more um, uh, like scientific uh, let's say analysis on the tools to see if they are used for that and to see the kind of uh, use uh, signs that are on the, on the rock. Some microscopical analysis. Yeah. So uh, let's go if uh, Jiri Raj is uh, satisfied. Let's go to the... Andrea? See, uh, no, it was possible, as I missed, to show some video because I wrong screen. It's at one. No, no, ma aspetta un secondo, che abbiamo ancora una domanda. Okay. Cioè, deve la... Lorian Bruno deve rispondere. There ah, was sì. a question also for Lorian Bruno, if I understood well. Lorian? 
Yes, hello. Um, uh, I'm not sure I understood your question, actually, uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, what, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood. Where is Jiri? So, but I, Jiri Raj, can you check? Jiri Raj, are you here with us? I'll mute him. The mute. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Hello. <laughs> please, please repeat Hello. Good. Uh, my question is that uh, what whatever this the raw card we are seeing at present, uh, when it was um, produced, uh, so in the larger portion and what have survived uh, a lot might have been gone away. So while calculating this the that is the matrix or this the the percentage of the motifs. We must also keep in mind the taphonomical feature, the effect of the climate on the survival of this rock art. Yes, of course. Many, a lot, surely that uh, what we see now is only a portion of what was actually uh, present in the landscape. And nowadays, there is a lot of destruction of the rock art and uh, we can see that many sites that we documented 10, 10 or 15 years ago are, are already been destroyed completely. So, yes, of course, we have to, to take this in, into account. Yes, of course, uh, as always, you know, data set is what you have at your disposal. But of course, uh, like in Portugal, <laughs> you were saying... Uh, and um, that probably is only a small portion of what existed and um, that is left today, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lorian. And now I have asked to Andrea Arca if he can share the video that we missed uh, uh, just before, as we have uh, some minutes. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know. If you can hear me, because I don't. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's one minute uh, video. Thank you very much. It's about the virtual tour of the virtual museum of uh, Balma dei Cervi. So it's online. Uh, click on the door to open, go inside. And uh, here's the panoramic view. You can uh, zoom uh, in and zoom uh, out, uh, zoom in, uh, zoom out. Um, turn around to see the surrounding uh, mountain environment, uh, the wood, the rock, uh, the panorama, uh, the Alps with uh, some snow, the soil. Here as there was a, a, an archaeological digging, the huge wall of the Barma dei Celvi. All this you can do it yourself by moving the, the mouse, as this is a recorded uh, video. And uh, more, you can take a look closer to the panels uh, here with uh, painted panels with uh, uh, enhanced colors. Uh, thank you again to Jon Arman for his uh, this stretch software. Open your side banner now? Very useful. And uh, this is uh, a obviously fake red colors. Um, we have uh, five sectors uh, here. Only the sector E, on, only to show the the, the most uh, evident, the most important. Uh, so all the documentation, uh, spherical pictures, uh, auto for the mosaic. Uh, Porto mosaics, the, um, the tracing, uh, um, vectorized tracing, uh, you can zoom in, uh, zoom out. And uh, finally, the uh, 3D models, one of the entire uh, panel and uh, other uh, uh, four for the sectors. Uh, here you can uh, see the sector here and uh, useful to take it online. So a virtual museum, uh, and uh, this was <laughs> the missed video during the presentation of Footsteps of Man uh, um, uh, Society. Okay, sorry, and thank you very much. Grazie, uh, grazie Andrea, uh, thank you very much. Ecco. Okay. Thank you. And we have a, a question from uh, Uji Akai, please. Dagli la voce. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a question on behalf of uh, Professor Ujasai. He would like to ask from Luis and uh, Lerni that uh, in the Himalayan, south side of the Himalaya, 
like the earliest uh, rock art and the late, latest rock, rock art about the like when what's the era of that uh, the specific the earliest and the latest one Okay, Lorian, can you answer? Maybe after it will be in the Lorian, al Bruno. Yeah, Luis. Okay, good afternoon. Um, so the earliest rock art um, in the Himalayas uh, is Neolithic. Uh, so actually quite similar to what we have seen for Portugal. Um, for some reason in the Almadias, we do not dare yet to say Paleolithic, but Neolithic. So fifth millennium BC and the latest rock. Uh, so this is in Northern Pakistan. In Ladakh, we do not have such uh, Neolithic rock art. Uh, it goes back to the third millennium with Bronze Age. Uh, rock art, much related to what is found in Central Asia and in Mongolia also. And uh, the latest rock art dates from the Buddhist uh, period, from the end of the first millennium, beginning of the second millennium, and it is uh, stupa images. Uh, you mean so the Buddhist century, century of millennium, century? No, the end of the first millennium. Beginning yeah, of the second okay. millennium. Yeah. So 10, 10, 10 century BC, um, uh, sorry, uh, 10 century after CE and 10, 12th century CE. So Buddhist monument images, tupas with Tibetan uh, inscriptions from the Nari period. Maybe it's a um, Western kingdom, Western Tibetan kingdom. Thank you very much. Any other question or we go on as we are just in time, a little bit late. So thanks and uh, let's go on with uh, uh, Roy Kerejazu Lewis, awareness of similarities between rock painting in Bolivia and Brazil. Uh, Roy, if you are with us, you can start. Thank you. In the first place, I want to thank and congratulate Centro Camuno di Studi Preistorici and the Cooperativa Archeologica Le Orme dell'Uomo for organizing this symposium on behalf of IFRAO. Uh, dear Gilira, it is a pleasure to see you. <laughs> My best wishes and hello. In fact, uh, our, vamos a la, in fact, this presentation has two titles. Awareness of similarities between rock paintings in Bolivia and Brazil and Nordeste tradition paintings, Brazil, Bolivia. The first title is too mild and unprecise. There is much more to it. The second title is too forcible, forceful. Neither one is totally adequate. Soon we shall have the correct words. The problem is that this is a big issue rock paintings of the Cerido sub-tradition, and in general, the Northeast tradition in Piauí and Ceará states, with similarities in other Brazilian states, such as Goiás, the both Mato Grosso states, and Southeastern Bolivia, what is called the Chiquitania region. All of these seem to have the same conceptual elements. This presentation is only informative. I am not trying to persuade anyone. In 20 minutes, it is impossible to do more. It is important to mention that this project 
is being carried out together with Raoni Valle, an excellent scholar from Brazil. Regarding the terminology I used in this presentation with words such as concept, essence, idea, idiosyncrasy, and spirit, I must say that they are provisional until a more and accepted terminology is established and accepted. So now I will proceed with the with the slides. Well, we have here uh, South America and Brazil and the states of Piauí and Ceará, where all this originates, is here approximately. And southeastern Bolivia. I don't know if you can see what the. No? Oh, well, the next one, please. Well, at the left, we have Brazil with the northeast, the Serra state, and the state of Piauí. And on the right, Bolivia. On the right and southeast is Santa Cruz, and the Chiquitania would, be, would occupy, occupy a great portion of the Santa Cruz uh, department, but on the eastern side. Siguiente. These are drawings uh, made by Gabriela Erika Pia in 1988. And they were paintings in the Chiquitania in southeastern Bolivia. She was the first person to show uh, these kind of paintings in all this area, southeast Bolivia, and mentioned the similarities with paintings in Brazil. But she didn't mention at all uh, the Northeast tradition, nor the Cerido. She only, she, she only said that there were similarities of paintings between both countries. During my presentation of uh, the paper Bolivian Rock Art in the Darwin Rock Art Congress, the first Aura Congress in 1988, uh, red paintings from Santa Cruz, Bolivia, and I showed this uh, this drawing, also made by Erika Pia. Uh, Nier de Guidon and Agueda Vialuna, uh, Vialu were present at my presentation. And then after they came to me and they said, well, that was that is astonishing. They very much look like the paintings we have in the state of Piauí. So that was the first uh, awareness, if you like, we had about these similarities. So I came back to Bolivia and I started uh, doing research here, but a bit I forgot about the words of Niera Guidon and Vialu until I came here to the Santa Cruz Valleys and in a place called Las Lauras II, I saw this painting, this picture, and I sort of found similarities with the Nordeste tradition in Brazil. Siguiente. After, well, uh, if we could go back to the previous one. So once I documented this site, I started looking for more in the Santa Cruz Valleys. The Santa Cruz Valleys are valleys in the, oh, the last uh, hills or mountains of the Andes that go down to the uh, lowlands of eastern Bolivia, and the Amazonas. So I started looking for other sites, Aurasil. And uh, Clovis Cardenas, it's a photograph of Clovis Cardenas uh, using this D stretch uh, hunting scene. And he has documented the 43 rock art sites we have in these Santa Cruz valleys. And one of them called Cueva Las Guitarras uh, has these very tiny, they are 
not more, none of these drawings or paintings are more than 10 centimeters long. And they looked very much like the, let's call uh, net, not Northeast tradition. We will mention them as net as, as from now on. And it, it is a hunting scene. You can see the, the projectile. I don't know if it is a, a lance or it is a, it, that are stuck on the animals, most probably deer. There is one that is lying down and it was very much astonishing, but this is not really very, very similar to what we have in net paintings, but there were some similarities. Next. Well, this is like they look like without uh, the D stretch and similarities with anthropomorphic figures of the Northeast tradition net site in Brazil, Toca, and these are sites that are very similar, have very similar paintings to these, no? Toca do Benta, Toca da Entrada, do Baixao da Vaca, Toca da Baixao Verde, and so on, uh, up to Toca do Paraguayo. It is a small uh, cave, a very long and small cave, and you have these paintings. They are not the only paintings. We also have in this cave, uh, paintings that belong to later times. Next. Another figure, and here I have reproduced uh, something that Anne-Marie Bessis uh, from Brazil, well, French working in Brazil, uh, said, said figurative, not realistic art represented according to a conventional code, not naturally, not natural reality. Uh, as I said before, I'm not going to go into what really is the, the net paintings, but just show what we have in Bolivia. And of course, it would have been better to show uh, some paintings from Brazil, but in 20 minutes, that is impossible. Next. A third site in these valleys was Verdecillo, and according to Raoni Valle, the theme of two figures put face to face, passing something between them is one of the emblematic compositional graphisms of the Northeast tradition. With this site, we have so far three rock art sites with a net concept in the Santa Cruz Valleys in Bolivia. Now we go to the Chiquitania, no? with the valleys, Santa Cruz valleys, the Andes uh, conclude and then starts the flat and lowlands of which on the east of Santa Cruz is the, it's called Chiquitania, southeastern Bolivia. And this Cueva Misenandino, it is a very large cave, provided the most authentic rock paintings with a great possibility of pertaining to the essence and concept of the Northeast tradition. You have the open mouths, you have the oval and fully painted uh, bodies, uh, the erect penises, uh, adornments on the back of the head, uh, linear uh, extremities and so on. Next. Cueva Miserendino, we're still with Cueva Miserendino. So far, it is the most important cave or site we have with uh, the net concept. Apparently, different moments of rock painting production, although the same net concept, but perhaps all of it is not net. No? But here again, you can see it is. For those that are Brazilians, I hope there are some Brazilians uh, acquainted with paintings of Piauí, Ceará, uh, and all that. Well, you can see that the similarities are really astonishing. Next. Cueva Miserendino, we are still with Cueva Miserendino. And here I mentioned some net characteristics. Uh, elongated bodies that, uh, of course, that coincide with the paintings in Brazil. Elongated bodies, some painted in the interior, 
linear and curved extremities, rounded oval heads, erect penises, in this case, within the same concept as Toca do Boqueirao, do Sitio da Pedra Furada in Brazil. Next. Still with Cueva Michelendino, other net characteristics, linear head prolongations, open mouths, erect penises, extended as if it were imploring arms, curved backwards legs, rounded oval, fully painted bodies. Next. And Cueva Miserandino again, typical row of rounded figures. Next. Well, how could all this have happened? Well, there's only about more than 3,000 kilometers from the state of Piauí to the region of Chiquitania in Bolivia, 3,000. We are talking here of hunter, gatherer, people, groups, whatever. So Raoni Valle has the hypothesis that this happened thanks to the dry diagonal. And this map was elaborated by him. It's a map showing the biogeographic dispersion of the dry diagonal in South America. The red triangles, Chiquitania in southeastern Bolivia, up to the southwest and Sao Raimundo Nonato in Piauí. And the yellow triangle is the Cerido region in Rio Grande do Norte, extracted and modified from Lima and E. Uh, I must say that apparently so far, most of the paintings we are finding here in Bolivia correspond to a resemblance with the Cerido region. Yeah. In total, well, if we sum up all the work done so far in the Chiquitani and southeastern Bolivia, of a sample of 45 studied rock art sites in the Rogore and San Jose region of Chiquitania, there are about, well, I must say that in total, we know more than 90 rock art sites in Chiquitania. But as I just said, uh, 45 were used for this research sample. 15 contain a similar concept of Northeast tradition elements. In these 15 sites, there are coincidences with the essence of net, agreste tradition, and serido tradition. Another rock site in Kitania, El Manantial. We are always talking about southeastern Bolivia. Here we have a row of 13 stylized zoomorphic figures. Similar rows are also present in net rock art in Brazil. This photograph was made by Raoni Valle last year when we went to the site. Next. We're still, well, this is a, my photographs, these ornithomorph figures, uh, apparently they belong to Re Americana, which is a sort of ostrich here in the lowlands of Bolivia. Similar scenes exist in the Cerido sub-tradition. Still in the Manantial, and here we have another pictorial element that corresponds to Cerido and of course, to net paintings, fitomorph figures, trees. This, in this case, the same concept as in Toca do Extrema II in Brazil. San Luis II, another site. It is the idea to be produced. Well, this, this is an elaboration of myself, no? 
it is not exactly a coincidence with the Rauni Valley. It is the idea to be produced, how the image to be painted conceives the spirit and the idiosyncrasy of the culture in question. Although geographic distances could lead to some differences in style or in forms or shapes. Next. In this side of San Luis too, there are a lot of superimpositions of later paintings, but some figures, especially around it, very small figure there, is has absolutely the net concepts. Siguiente. San Silvestre, another site. In all these comparative analysis, the main concern, well, my main concern and of, of it, uh, has been to try to perceive the concept of the images, no? not merely aspects related to styles or shapes or forms, but the concept applied to the production of scenes and images. At the beginning of this dissertation, I mentioned that this terminology could be or will be changed in the future, but for the time being, I uh, consider them appropriate. San Silvestre was a fantastic small panel. The comparative analysis has been carried out, bearing in mind the concept does not necessarily, con well, uh, I will repeat that. The comparative analysis has been carried out, bearing in mind that concept does not necessarily conduce to net images although an important repetition of the same concept would have more probabilities to confirm a certain relationship. We are still with San Silvestre. The fact that similar cultural concepts are present from Biaui in Brazil and also in other states such as Goiás and Mato Grosso and in southeastern Bolivia, which is the Chiquitania, suggests that the general ideas to be produced on the rocks had a similar spirit and therefore idiosyncrasy. All this implies a broader way of trying to understand how hunting gatherer people prospered in similar dry ecosystems along the dry diagonal in South America before the development of agro ceramist cultures that later had their own migrations. Uh, yeah, next. Southeastern Bolivia, we just received images of another site previously unknown to us. So this means that the work goes on. Thank you very much. I must say that with Rauni, we are preparing a scientific paper that will be published uh, perhaps next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy. Thank you for very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, we go on now with uh, Linnea uh, Sundstrom. Uh, repeat. Ah, sorry, no, no, with uh, Gori Tumi Echevarria Lopez. Sorry, sorry, Linnea, no, you are late. Building chronologies, a new view of Peruvian Kilkas or rock art. Uh, Gori of the Association Peruana de Arte West. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to give this conference. Thank you, Angelo, for, to host this conference. Now, I'd like to, to send uh, many saludos you know, um, to Giriga Kumar. It's great to see you and to Roy Kerejasu, you know, to people I, I, I care very much. Okay. Um, we want to talk about this uh, uh, chronologies we're building in, in Peruvian rock art. 
we change many things in 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 Peruvian uh, archaeology this material. So uh, we co are gonna do something because we have many data. I mean, many many slides. Wanna do something very uh, kind of fast so we have a good panorama of what what is going on with Peruvian um, um, procar or kilkas. So we changed a lot of things, a lot of things in, uh, since the Peruvian Rock Association were uh, founded in uh, <clears throat> 15 years ago. One of the, the principal things we changed is in the name, you know, uh, we found uh, the original native name uh, for this phenomenon, graphic phenomena in Peru, and the word is Kilka. So uh, this one, uh, uh, other changes we, we made in the in the academic world of this rock art research, but this name is not new. Is uh, what used in the Peruvian Academy for from the forties. So uh, we using this this kind of name now. Um, also, we have with these four types of rock art, rock art or, or kilkas in Peru: um, pictograms, petroglyphs, geoglyphs, and uh, mobiliar art. You know, with uh, rock art tradition. So we uh, we when we made these chronologies or. or or Kilkas or Rocar in Peru, we uh, work with all, all these materials because all these uh, types of Rocar are, are uh, distributed in, in in Peru. So uh, the methodology we use, uh, well, every site is is you know a uh, whole uh, uh, complexity. And we made a sample selection. We recovered the data. We uh, look for super superpositions, stratigraphy of motifs. And we may um, form a comparative approach too, uh, in a lower scale, you know, and inter inter sites uh, mostly. We work with uh, this operational hypothesis, you know, that the sites possess a sequence of graphic production, you know. So there must be significant groups or series of formal uh, of formal series, you know, corresponding with cultural implications. And we comparing our results with other sites. So we can test our hypothesis in other archaeological contexts, um, and we have this. We will see. We work. We are going to show three cases. You, you, I, I think most of you know where is Peru, in the world, in South America. We are uh, Andean countries with Bolivia, and this is Peru. And this is three cases uh, when we can achieve to create a long, long sequence of Peruvian uh, rock art, you know, in this in this territory. And these cases are in central coast of Peru, you know, South Highland, uh, Amazonian area in Cusco, and very near, near to Machu Picchu site, and the South Coast and Highland. And um, uh, one moment, please. Okay. And we want to start with the central coast. Uh, this is the area, the capital of, of Peruvian Republic. Um, we research more than 20 sites, archaeological sites with kilkas in this area. And we uh, found uh, that we, we can, I mean, we did seven uh, phases of rock art production as a follow. The phase one is characterized with uh, these couples. You know, the, the native name is Tocos, these couples. In different sites, you know, this is different sites. More than twenty, we we uh, we can see this um, uh, sequ sequence. We have uh, the phase two. We have many archaeological sites which share this kind uh, characteristic um, rock art production. And this is uh, in the central coast of Peru, as I say. We have uh, phase three. This is a chronological. Um, Marker because uh, this uh, design is very well known from the Chavin civilization. So we have uh, stylistic markers to uh, control our chronology. So in this uh, figure, we have a Chavin image uh, with an image from the from the um, phase two uh, in one uh, figure. So it's it's a good uh, chronological marker to control our our, our sequence. This uh, phase four A. Uh, we have a different kind of design, you know, it's more an, an, um, anthropic designs. You can see this. And we have again, after this, another intrusion or, gra or Chavin graphic. So this is another uh, temporal marker. 
in uh, phase 4b we have geoglyphs in, in in this area of peru this is very interesting because in the capital of, of peruvian republic we have lots of archaeological sites many uh, with rock art or kilkas and we have uh, very much um, geoglyphs in near uh, the this this area in the capital so this is very old stuff you know we will see the chronology uh, uh, further and we have phase 5b and the, we have this petroglyphs this is archaeological site sorry this is the archaeological site of, of Chekta. And this is phase sorry aha uh -huh. okay we have phase six, six. this is paintings in different sites or or, or central peruvian area and we have seven phase seven this is very late this is almost in the time where the inca empire uh, right to lima and very next to the spanish invasion uh european invasion in, in our country so this is uh, probably the last one of the last uh, stage of rock car production in our country in the central uh, coast area so uh, this is phase 7a this is almost contemporary with the with the other uh, phase uh, we can see uh, we have another um, uh, chronological um, marker here because we have very close similarities with the pottery you know uh, late pottery and the and the petroglyphs are very very similar uh, in this stage of or of uh, kilkas or car production we have another kind of, of kilkas you know, again, we have these uh, couples for, for late uh, context in archaeological uh, times or country. And we have this, you know, phase one is at least from 2000 years before uh, Common Era, and phase uh, seven is, uh, is um, from uh, 1000 to 1050. Uh, 530 uh, years after Common Era, when the Spanish people invade our country. So, uh, as you can see, this is very complex. Is we have very different traditions and very uh, much in a very many intrusions, or graphic intrusion um, from people around the the, the highlands or the, or the Andes. So, um, the complexity, our sequence is is very interesting because we can see how uh, complex is our old graphic history, yeah, at least in this part of the country. We move on, we're gonna see the, the South Highland Amazonian uh, of Peru. This is an area very, very interesting because this is in the, um, uh, in the area between the highlands and the um, uh, Amazonian area, you know? This is, uh, a territory that Roy Crejasu uh, made a, a very long research, you know, in this contact zone. Okay, we were working in the Machu Picchu National Park for some years, uh, and we discovered in this site, after May, uh, you know, explorations, prospections, the area, more than 40 archaeological sites just in the just in the Machu Picchu Archaeological uh, Park. More than 40 archaeological sites, 40. Um, the complexity of the graphic production is amazing here. Is is this many different um, formal uh, traditions of rock art productions uh, and, and graphic um, uh, traditions um, or, or graphic languages? You know, we can see uh, petroglyphs here. We can see this. This different. This is one site. With two different um, formal languages in the uh, rock art production. This is Cedro Bamba, and this is Canabamba, another archaeological with paintings, um, archaeological site with paintings. Um, we have this city, this site, Machai Salapunku. You know, you can see uh, this is uh, also paintings, Yawar Wakatu. And uh, we have this site, Miskai Pukio too. Um, very very old site in in the in the Machu Picchu National Park, and we have Wilcaracay tomb. But this is a tomb in the you know in part inside part of the tomb in the rock. We have this this um, paintings, and we have uh, tocos or uh, cupules too in the Inca road. 
which is very interesting to for this area. And we have colonial um, um, Ilka, so colonial rock art too. Uh, you can see in the left the Vilcabamba uh, River. This is um, an area with very, very um, contrast and um, heavy geography. This is Cruz Mezcay. And we have Kilkas in Machu Picchu too. Uh, so there is two archaeological sites. The most uh, you know known sites here is uh, the Serpent Rock and the Sun Rock. Both were discovered by Hiram Bingham in the 1911, I think, or 12. So uh, uh, the Sun Rock, you can see the image to the left, to the right. You know, is is petroglyphs. The same rock, there are petroglyphs too and uh, couples. And in Machu Picchu, in this, this section called Pachamama, we have, uh, we discovered these um, paintings too. Um, and this is an area with, with um, tombs. And this, uh, this rock now is, is with many graffiti. So it was uh, very interesting uh, to make the discovery because this image it had nothing to do with the Inca times. You know, it's, it's completely different to the Inca uh, formal language. And this is another site in the Machu Picchu area in Caterra with different stage of rock art production. We have uh, Paraguachayoc to the to the right. So you can see uh, the graphic language is completely different. And, and, and this is uh, very interesting because uh, the sites are very close to each other. And we can um, uh, think that this is a different interaction of different people and different times. It's, it's very obvious this, but um, the complexity is, is very big. So we make excavations in some archaeological sites on the Machu Picchu uh, National Park. And we, find, uh, we found this house. Uh, very, very old house. This is 1,000 years before uh, Comunera or before Christ. And we found this rock with uh, petroglyphs in, in the Machu Picchu area. So we have uh, some, not much, not many, but very few um, chronolo chronological markers to the rock art production in, in the Machu Picchu uh, National Park. Uh, one is this, we found this um, with these kind of lines, you can see, you know, in size lines, and these tokos or these uh, cupules. And we have another uh, rock here, two rocks, very soft uh, rock. And we have two these um, uh, cupules and this in, in size lines. This is in, in uh, archaeological con context. So, um, Outside the Machu Picchu National Park, we made uh, with excavations in the Marcavalle uh, site, and we found two archaeological contexts with uh, with Kilkas rock art. And we have this tomb uh, to the left. Uh, this is uh, a very old site. This is 1,300 years before uh, Comunera. And we found this tomb with two rocks to the left, you know, uh, with um, cupules and inside insides um, lines um, and we have also this uh, this wall to the right and we have this uh, we found this rock with insides and li lines too so we have materials to make a very uh, um, uh, how you can see this a control comparison you know to to this size in Cusco and Machu Picchu in both sides with excavations and uh, we can, um, we are pretty sure about the chronology and the connection between those sites. So uh, we have very, very good uh, for the early times uh, chronological um, markers. This is Yanama in uh, archaeological part of Choquequirao. This is another huge uh, Inca archaeological site in Vilcabamba Park in, in the jungle Amazonian area in, in, in Cusco. So we have this. Uh, formal language or, or rock art production or Kilka's production in paintings. This is very, uh, this is late stuff. Okay, because we have lots of sites here, we have uh, to choose sites with complex sequences. Uh, and one of those was Salapunku. Salapunku um, show uh, three um, 
phase of production or stage of rock art production. And we have Pampacawa, it's another very complex, interesting archaeological site in Machu Picchu area. And we have uh, in this site, just in this site, we have um, seven uh, stage rock art production or kick art production. Every single phase with uh, peculiar uh, formal languages. And we have Tunasmoco one, another complex site in, in, in the Machu Picchu area. And we have here uh, five stages of Kilka's production. We have Tunasmoco two, also in, in the Machu Picchu area. And this site is one of the most complex archaeological uh, sites with rock art or Kilka's in Peru, in the whole country, because this site has. 23 uh, stage of rock art production is amazing. And we're pretty sure about this because we have in this site was uh, one uh, chronological marker, which is this central figure. You can see this central figure. It's, this is a very classic uh, design from the Inca civilization, very classic. And a whole scene about this. And after the, we, after this, we, I mean, over this, we can find uh, we we find we found superpositions on or, or paintings over uh, this these Inca paintings, you know, and these Inca paintings are over you know on the top another um, graphic uh, uh, productions, and we have uh, on and on this kind of superposition in this singular site with five of six six panels which. Um, uh, makes uh, Tunasmoco to one of the more complex uh, archaeological sites with card in in our country, especially for this um, Andean Amazonian uh, tradition. So we had 23 uh, uh, stages of Kilka's production. This means, you know, this means that the complexity of the <laughs> Andean Amazonian interaction is very big. You know, and we have Coliwara China too, where is um, this um, image of colonial Kilkas uh, or Roca production. This is very interesting because we, what we found this cross, uh, Calvario cross, you know, with human uh, figures there too. So we have uh, just for this area 20 nights uh, uh, station Roca production. Uh, in this area is huge, is is massive, uh, it's very many, uh, many, many faces for this uh, chronology. So we have phase two, you can see, uh, we don't have all chronological uh, markers, so we have an idea what is going on in, in, in this area, you know, you can see. So we have 29, uh, 29 stage rock art production. Uh, we, we moved to South Coast and Highland of Peru, this is the longest uh, rock art sequence we, we, we achieved. Um, we have this area entry, uh, Tagnan and Mukewa. We found these caves um, with rock art. In this case, uh, we have very few sites, but are very complex. So we can, uh, we did a, a very long sequence here. Karamoyi Cape, this is the archaeological landscape, the, the landscape of the area next to the archaeological site. And we have these uh, Kilkas. Here we have uh, at least three uh, different um, formal formal uh, um, uh, traditions. We we can say we, we can say this. Uh, this. We have these formal traditions, and this is not contemporary each other. So we have a sequence here. Uh, you can see this. There is superposition, and the formal language is very different to each other. So it's, it's, it's very clear that we have um, different um, graphic personalities in this uh, small cape. Here we have a, a group from a group B. Gori, you have a one minute. Uh, it's... Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'm finishing. So okay. we have this uh, panel two, this is another graphic uh, tradition. And we have the Toquepala cave, which is very famous. And we have in Toquepala, uh, the stratigraphic control, what we need to do this um, uh, correlation. So we have um, this material and we comp make comparison to Kepala with Karamoy and we found these similarities in with other archaeological sites. So we have this rock, you no, know, this is mobiliary art 
Uh, and this is the same graphic language with the Karamoji, uh, Karamoji cape, and we have these connections. So we have the Mikuy archaeological site, which is huge. It's more than 20 kilometers, square kilometers. And we have uh, phase one, uh, phase two. Phase two is very important because it makes the connection, formal connection with, with the cable Karamoye. So we allow us to complete the sequence of um, at least seven phases for this graphic tradition, this long, long uh, sequence of rock art tradition in South Paro, Peru. Uh, uh, we have another chronological market in the uh, lithic industry for this area. So we, you can see we use different strategies to make a uh, chronological sequence here. Okay. So we have geoglyphs for the phase three too. So we have a very complete panorama of rock art production in the area. So we have uh, now 9,000 years is our, our lower data for the first phases rock art production to the uh, just in Tagna, just in this area to uh, 500 years after uh, common era for the later phase. So we have almost 10,000 years of chronology or rock art production in the Tagna Mokewa region. 10,000 years. This is um, it's amazing. Um, all this um, history of rock art production we have in Peru. They never stop to produce kilkas. Or, or rock car, you know? So 10 years ago, there was no single long sequence for Kilkas in Peru, apart change this, you know? The sequence are the reflection of, in a small scale from the complexity of the coastal high mountain Amazonian societies of Peru, you know? But uh, sequence is a hypothesis to be tested. You know, this is a hypothesis, yeah, you know? We are pretty uh, sure that we, uh, we are confident about what we did, but we need more uh, examinations in competitive sequences. So many things have changed um, in Peruvian rock art after uh, the APAR uh, Foundation, and we are happy to share this with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gori, for this uh, very interesting and important presentation. And now we go to Linnea Sundstrom, Rethinking Rock Art, Reforming Settler Colonialist Perspectives in Research. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, very good. good. Okay. I, I, I had to change computers at the last second, so um, happens, my heart's happens. pounding a little bit. We made it. Um, okay, let me get my screen going. And let's show, come on. There we go. Uh, over the course of 43 years of rock art research, I have struggled with finding useful approaches as probably all of you have done. I am guilty of some of the questionable approaches I'll be listing today but I have tried to find ways of thinking about rock art that allow it to speak for itself and not for my biases. Because Eurocentrism, not to say white supremacy, underpins the culture of academia, we all must be aware of its effects and try to counteract them with more balanced approaches. By the way, when I say European here, I am including Euro-American, Euro-Australian, et cetera, et cetera. That is concepts and practices with roots in European culture and spread via colonialism. So the first uh, problem I discuss is misapplication of theories of cultural evolution. 19th century scholars got all excited about Darwin and evolution and tried to apply his theory to anthropology. Now that has a bit of validity in archeology span because the earliest societies were small, dispersed and non-hierarchical. Only later do nation states appear with cities, specialized workers and social status based on accumulation of wealth and power. But cultural evolution has no validity when applied to people today. Indigenous communities cannot logically or historically be considered primitive in the sense that early human communities were primitive. Small scale societies are not less evolved than urbanized ones, 
but each type has developed continually in response to its own needs and values. The book shown here asserts that all, in all but a single instance, abstract rock art precedes pictorial rock art, not just in the American West, but worldwide. The author attributes this to some universal human shift, which he calls cognitive development. In other words, brain evolution that hit different populations at different times. The premise of the book requires that fully modern humans that migrated to and populated the Americas were somehow too backward to draw pictures. This despite the existence of pictorial art throughout Eurasia since 30 or 40,000 years ago and a good 14 to 24 millennia before the migrants left for America. This author denies working under a Darwinian framework. However, it is impossible to comprehend his theory in any other terms. Asserting that any fully modern humans were incapable of making pictures necessarily involves the notion that some human groups are less evolved than others, an idea that most anthropologists gave up over a century ago. The notion that pictorial imagery was later to develop than abstract imagery is also unsupported by the data. And these are uh, panels from about the middle of North America. As you can see here, they're very early. Um, more universally in considering these pig drawings from Indonesia, which may be the oldest cave drawings thus far found anywhere. And I'll just show you one more example from my research area in North America. Uh, you can see this very old um, abstract rock art here, but if you apply infrared imaging, you can see that it's the abstract is superimposed over earlier black painted figures of a bison, another bison, probably a human, and that may be another human and so forth. So the data are not supporting this grand uh, theory. Okay, the second problem that I see is assuming that all cultures evolved toward the European pattern. Um, Terms like proto-writing, pre-literate, and pre-urban embed an assumption that all cultures will develop to look like ours given enough time. I don't have time to, to detail this, but we'll just mention the notion of some ancient or not so ancient repeated designs uh, said to indicate an incipient writing system. This crops up from time to time. Mostly these studies lack supporting data apart from vaguely seeming like they ought to be alphabets. So here's a couple of examples from the literature. The third problem I see is inappropriately applying European concepts and terms to indigenous and ancient cultures. Rock art researchers continue to struggle with terminology and good for glory for finding a better term. Um, rock art, uh, the problem is that some concepts from modern European based cultures simply do not apply to other cultures. Among these are a distinction between sacred and secular, the notion of unremitting political power of an elite class over others in the community, and the existence of only two genders. Indigenous people have also questioned the term rock art because it implies something made for aesthetic gratification. They note correctly that little, if any, indigenous and ancient rock imagery was created for aesthetic purposes. A better term might be rock stories. It seems to me that nearly all indigenous markings on rock surfaces were made for one of two purposes. The first was to evoke an event in real or in myth, mythological time. The second was to establish a personal link to a place where one experienced a life crisis. In some cultures, adolescents marked the place where they first isolated from their community in a rite of passage. In some, adults marked places where they sought or received assistance from the spirit world or the ancestors. A fourth issue that I see is reinforcing popular racial or ethnic stereotypes. What these book titles have in common 
is a focus on something called war. It is true that much of the rock art of the Great Plains of North America was made in service to a relatively short-lived cultural phenomenon, sometimes called the warrior cult. That term still contains the problematic root war, but at least it centers the individual's agency and the religious context of their actions. Native American warrior societies generally operated not as anything like an army, but as groups of peers in service to the larger community. The warrior societies held rituals, provided policing of large camps when needed, and occasionally organized raids on enemies to acquire horses, captives for adoption, or access to hunting grounds. Almost all such conflict was ritualized and limited in scope and casualties. The most common form of armed conflict, especially before the horses came in, was the scalp raid, organized after the death of a beloved community member or fellow warrior at the hands of an enemy. A widespread belief held that a, a portion of one's soul or essence resided in the hair, and that soul could serve as a guide or servant to the dead person on their journey to the place of the dead. The obligation to provide this companion for a loved one was sacred and compelling. Once the scalp was taken, the warriors returned to the community and offered the scalp to the slain comrade's parents or wife. And here you see, um, these are drawings of rock art panels. And I think these people have scalps. It's a little hard to tell. And then this is a Lakota ledger drawing that shows women using the scalps in a mourning ceremony for their uh, loved one. The scalp was, was discarded after enough time had passed for the slain one's journey to the other side, usually four days. This led to constant reciprocal scalp raids, but war as experienced in the European world was un fathomable to Native American communities. A loss of 30 warriors was devastating. The tens of thousands lost in American and European battles was unimaginable. Sporadic scalp raiding might continue for decades, but the idea of constant year-round years or decades-long wars was not within the experience of Native America. There were reasons and seasons for armed conflict, but they were few and far between. Now, the popularity of research about the so-called warlike Indians that match a stereotype is not the fault of the researcher. Plenty of rock art panels do illustrate conflict, but even within the realm of biographic art, other subjects present themselves. What we have termed warfare was mostly a ritual, albeit one that sometimes meant killing or being killed. It is easy to lose that aspect in presenting this rock art to the public. Meanwhile, rock art linked to other aspects of life, such as women's reproductive power, receives relatively little attention. Our deep cultural tradition of prudishness may be a factor there, but my guess is that the bigger factor is that in addition to embracing stereotypes, our culture glorifies war and violence, um, America in particular. A fifth problem is what I would call othering, and the specific example I'm going to give is the application of the term shaman and shamanism. The word shaman was borrowed from an Arctic culture in Russia to describe a social role by which particular individuals were called upon to enter a trance to predict the future. This practice involves specific actions such as chanting, drumming, and what's called a shaking tent ritual. These are not universal, but limited to the European Arctic, the Inuit and Aleut sphere, and some Native American cultures in a direct line of contact with Arctic cultures. Today, however, the terms shaman and shamanism are applied so widely as to be almost meaningless. Basically, the, term now, the terms now connote any religious person or thing that is not like ours. The term shaman is even applied to full-time religious specialists in urbanized societies who would be better termed priests. Many indigenous cultures recognized separate roles for healers, mentors, those leading ceremonies, and those who might glimpse the future. However, researchers have collapsed that complexity into the single term shaman. 
what was a matter of one person helping another get through a life crisis, physical, emotional, developmental, or economic, somehow became viewed as a belief system that is undefined other than it is different somehow from European ones. Shamanism carries with it more than a whiff of the exotic, the mysterious, and the primitive. Essentializing all non-Western societies in this way falsely just juxtaposes them against Western religious traditions. They do shamanism, we do religion. It is worth remembering that the real difference is not in belief in the mysterious abilities of shamans, but in how some systems of spiritual support are controlled by bureaucracy and access to wealth, as opposed to existing within a non-hierarchical community. A sixth problem uh, is related, and that has to do with ignoring data that don't fit the scheme. A great deal of ink, including some of my own, has hit paper on the subject of phosphines and toptics, or whatever one cares to call, the patterns and images the human brain perceives in the absence of visual stimuli. All people experience these basic grids, circles, swirls, spirals, sunbursts, etc. While these images are typical of altered states of consciousness brought on by illness, deprivation, stress, or psychoactive drugs, we all experience them in a variety of situations throughout our lives. Some rock art may have been produced to record or induce altered states of consciousness, but it is not reasonable to come to that conclusion, much less to label it shamanism, whatever that means, in the absence of corroborating evidence. These are just a couple of examples that have been uh, identified that way. Uh, so we have this double standard going. Motifs said to indicate altered states of consciousness and or shamanism, skeletons, fantastic creatures, uh, flying people and the like, are rife in European art of the Middle Ages, as you see here. But in this context, they are not said to be shamanism. In the Great Plains, at least, rock art related to the vision quest, uh, which is an altered state of consciousness, consists of images of animals together with zigzag lines to represent the idea of supernatural power, or their pictures of people fasting or weeping. In other words, the vision-related images are naturalistic pictures not abstract designs composed solely of patterns or geometrics. On the other side, modern art and design is rife with abstract images, minus the assumption that the maker was out of his or her right mind. A seventh issue is looking at the world through European lenses. And the example I'm gonna give is about male primacy. In a recent study of how people today imagine Paleolithic cave art on the one hand and Native American rock art on the other, I found that 91% of popular images showed only men creating cave art. Perhaps more disturbing is that 89.5% of images for educational materials such as you see here showed only men. The picture for Native American rock art is just as warped, despite available ethnographies confirming that girls and women made rock art. In this category, 90% of images for educational materials showed only men as making the images. Clearly, the Eurocentric notion that men are doers and women are done too still controls how we see these other cultures. Now, it's not all terrible. Um, rock art has contributed a lot to um, making research about ancient people and indigenous people better. These things are just food for thought. Despite these false starts, rock art research has also been an antidote to racism in anthropology. By moving the discussion away from stones, bones, and body morphology, to the realms of communication, mythology, religion, and creativity. 
Rock art provides a unique view of non-material aspects of human communities. Importantly, professional research has debunked the space alien and or wandering European myths that indigenous communities could not possibly have created what the archeologists find. Rock art research has enriched our knowledge of the past and can do so even better in the future. And uh, one way is by providing a path for productive collaboration with descendant communities, bringing them face to face as it were with their ancestors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linnea, and for this very interesting presentation. And now we go to Robin Gay Wakeland, the Pueblo area petroglyph in the uh, Galisteo Basin, Santa Fe County, New Mexico. Of the uh, Robin is part of the Arara Association. We are waiting for uh, Robin Gay Wakeland, who is listening to us, please uh, go online. Otherwise, we go on with uh, Carol Patterson, if she is available. Yes, I am. I have to uh, set up just a second. Yeah, yeah, no problem. We will uh, uh, recover the presentation of Robin later. Maybe we can exchange if uh, he will be available again. Anyway, Carol Patterson will talk about Indian runners and uh, leader displays of ancient trackways. Okay, let's see. And so are you sharing my screen yet? Um, you should do that. Do you see it now? Not yet. Yes. No, not yet. You should uh, share the, the desk. Share screen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Put put it in in, uh, in modality presentation, please. Now I don't understand how. Yeah, if you put the mouse, uh, the arrows in from the beginning on the very left. Um, on I've the very left. Screens up here. Under file, it's written from beginning. If you press there. Well, this one is, I don't want to show. So I'm putting it on the second one. Okay. We want to, but put it in the mode of the presentation so we see the bigger screen. Why can't I get full screen on this? You go down, go down, down the slide on the right. Okay, so so now how do okay? So wait a minute, we've got the. I got, yeah, sure. Now we have a closed, you closed the presentation, you should reopen. 
and or share it again. What happened to it? <clears throat> You should share it again. Yes, it is like as well. Okay. No. Okay, so it's on. Okay, now put it in uh, the the presentation mode. Slideshow. See, I don't have the uh, full. Oh, no, you have it. It's uh, it's uh, in the. You no. If you go down, uh, where it is written notes, can you see there on the very line on the very bottom? Uh, it's, it's written it, notes, it's and then you move. Now. You move the 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 mouse on the fourth. Uh, the bar isn't, I, I don't have a full screen is the problem. Uh, I, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I can't seem to get it. Uh, a full screen on, uh, <clears throat> on this screen. Uh, I, I have two things showing at the same time. I have you and I have the PowerPoint behind me. Is it is it going at all? Uh, well, I don't know what to do. I can't get it to be a real screen. I don't have the bar on the bottom. You, you can start, please. Start okay. from the beginning, your beginning. All right. What I wanted to do is play some songs here. Can you hear that? Someone slipped. Someone slipped. Yes, we can. Water. I don't the sky. I run until I fly. Ramble on foot, become your stance. Ramble on foot, become your dance. Scramble on foot, become your trance. Gamble on foot, become your chance. I come on foot, I go on foot. I run on ice water. I run to the cold sky. I run until I fly. Run for life. Run to the long world. When you run with strife, you run to the long world. Run for the knife. Run to the strong world. For a man and wife, run to the song world. Run to the song world. Run to the song world. I come on foot. I go on foot. I run on icy water. I run into the dark sky. I run until I fly. Stay on foot, become your horse. Stay on foot, become your force. Pray on foot, your source. So, welcome everybody. I just wanted to um, get you in the mood of what these runners are like from uh, their perspective of. <clears throat> running, running really long distances, uh, and start with a story about um, an author, Will Carter's Death Comes to the Archbishop, 
north of Laguna, two runners sped by going somewhere east on an Indian business. They saluted Sabido by gestures with the open palm, but did not stop. They coursed over the sand with fleetness of young antelope, their bodies disappearing and reappearing among the sand dunes like shadows that eagles cast in their strong, unhurried flight. For the Navajo, talking God comes around in the morning, knocks on the door and says, get up my grandchildren, it's time to run, run for health and wealth. So <clears throat> we're talking about ritual running, not actually for competition or glory, but running for the tribe, for the vitality, um, for the strength, and spiritual running is basically what we're going to see that's reflected in the rock art that shows uh, runners. <clears throat> what the runners wear are these painted designs on their chests. Uh, for protection and good luck. They wear a wide cotton belt around their waist that can carry goods for trade. And they wear a V-shaped breech cloth down their sides. They can wear a necklace like this with beads and uh, amulets in them for charms, for safety, and for good luck. They wear these white cotton belts that are woven that can stash dried meat and berries for sustenance that they carry on long distance runs. <clears throat> and they wear these breech cloths that are V-shaped like this uh, that tie around the back of the waist. And this is what they look like in the petroglyphs. These are pictographs of runners in Grand Gulch of the Southwest US. You can see they have their little necklace. They have their waistband right in here and their V-shaped uh, breech cloths. These are the running roads that are run for trade all throughout the Southwest. Uh, they run all the way down to Mexico and the coast. And I'm only showing you around uh, the study area that's encircled by blue that wasn't mentioned in this early publication. But the runners look like this and they have they're tied trade goods on their belts with medicine plants like OSHA, cotton, agave fibers, precious stones and shells, pinion nuts that were supplied to the Hopis by the Yuma and the Navajos. And the Western Apache brought sunflowers to the seeds to the Zuni, Santa Domingo, Pueblo, Navajo, and Paiute traders brought wood to the Hopi mesas. <clears throat> and other things like the Pima sent Devil's Claw to Quechuan and Papago, who supplied the neighbors with agave fibers. Um, Western Apache and Upland Yuman supplied dried mezcal se uh, seeds, sheets to Mojave and Papago and Maricopay, and Hopi villages, Zuni and Navajo. Cotton was traded by the Pima, Hopi to Papago and Navajo, respectively. So... They shared a common language, uh, either of one participant or a third language that they both knew. And of course, the sign language, which is very important to me, the open palm for the peace and the crossed arms for trade. And these trade routes are shown on the right that are from Zuni, connecting all the way up to the Blue Mountains, which is north of the study area. So I've marked in the red lines that show possible uh, trade routes going through the important villages, prehistoric Pueblo, uh, great houses and settlements along the river corridors and in these uh, river basins. And getting even closer to Bluff where I live are these uh, prehistoric roads marked in red that run north and south the squares are the great houses that are in the area. <clears throat> and the little remnants of lines, red lines, are the prehistoric roads that they've been um, identified in the LIDAR phot photography. Now, the blue dots are sites that have the pictures of the runners that run along these roads. <clears throat> and let me just get this. So <clears throat> here's a close up of Google showing the remnants of the red roads as they run through. This white area is called the comb. 
It's a sandstone structure that sticks up right out of the ground, up, um, up about three or 400 feet. And the roads go up to it and across the other side. And on the left is a site called Long Fingers, where you see the little runner. All you get to see is the little yucca necklace, the waistband, and the V-shaped loincloth. On the right are three, four little sites that show a little character I call Eyebrow Guy, as he's got his little smiley face and his necklace and his waistband and so on. And then three more down in the lower bottom that uh, we're all going to talk about as we go along. So here's a close up of uh, the runner at Longfinger's house with just his uh, necklace and his waistband and his breech cloth. This is a cave we call Rattle Cave with very worn uh, surface with very, very difficult runners to see. This is extremely enhanced so that I could draw it, um, but they have these little faces and the cross bands for maybe, probably a trader that was running. Um, <clears throat> and then just a regular guy with his necklace and his waistband and his breech cloth. I want to talk about ritual running, and this is about more a spiritual and kind of praying thing that they do. It's not uh, a competitive race, but it's ritual running, and it's run to help the clouds come out for rain. For some groups, for other groups, they run to keep the sun on track as he goes from the east to the west, or they run to draw out the clouds to rain on the crops, or they run to unite the people and bring good health. So I call it, so it's called ritual running. Here are Hopi runners that run for the sun and for the moon to keep them uh, either, the Hopi like to either slow down the sun or speed it up. The Zuni runners run for lightning and rain, rainfall and snowfall, and you can see all the dots on their bodies uh, for moisture dots, not in top tip designs, um, and lightning running down them. So uh, that's what they run for. You actually have two teams here, two for lightning and two for moisture or snow all. And this is what they look like at a site on Lower Butler Wash near Bluff, Utah. And you can see just the glowing eyes, the cotton belt and the V-shaped uh, breech cloth and a sash that they wear across their chest. This is the panel itself. Uh, it dates around 600 AD um, or earlier, but probably right around there is Basque Maker II or Pueblo uh, I or II right in that area. It's hard to date, the sandstone's very soft, um, but when you enhance it, you can see a little bit better what's going on. These are cloud figures, and I don't have time to go into all the reasons why, but I've drawn the whole panel just to show you that the runners are in the same context as these large cloud figures. And I want you to look at this very last figure with a um, image on the top of its head. It looks like this, and it's similar to another panel on the San Juan River called the uh, Kachina panel, where these are baskets or vessels, as they call it, that open up and let rain come out. So they're clouds that carry vessels like they did not have pottery at this time, we're basket maker period. And so they are using a symbol of a basket or a vessel, symbol of a vessel that they all are familiar with that can be clay lined and held by these sticks and can hold water. So if you're talking about a cloud being, you would refer to these vessels that the cloud beings uh, possess that pour water out. When the thunder rises up and bangs against these things and makes the rain come out, and then that's a long talk I can give another time. 
So here we have the cloud beings, and they read from left to right. I mean, from right to left, where we started on the right with the being the um, vessel over here, but we're showing this part of the panel that goes with moisture dots here and lightning coming down his front, moisture dots and thunder pounders up on, on his head. They look like hammer stones, but this one here is actually raining. These are called rain beards or hair that falls on his shoulder that brings rain down, lightning over uh, his side. And he's actually being pulled forward by a runner below. You see him pull, touching this little runner down here. And here's the runners all in a row. One has crosses. Uh, sashes on his chest that may represent being a, a trade runner, long distance runner, but other runners uh, in this panel. So, Carol, like, you have two minutes. Okay, cloud chiefs. Well, we're not here's a picture of a relay race uh, track. Here are the tracks running in through uh, modern pueblos that run east and west. <laughs> Here's the Apache version with the feathers on their heads of Apache runners and uh, Apache panels. So all I can talk about in two minutes is this. Uh, the team runners are not wearing menstrual belts, but they're wearing uh, breech cloths like this. It was another European idea that these were all women parading around in their menstrual skirts, but really they're teams of kickstick runners. And here's a team with their shirt on and everybody else in their little things. So ritual running looks like this in the LIDAR photographs. They run around a circle around the village and that's the end. So here we have the LIDAR roads and all the circlements around the villages for ritual running. Thank you. Thank you very much All right. for this uh, interesting presentation. And now I ask to Robin uh, Gay Wakeland, if he's uh, available to give uh, his presentation, please. Robin? Please. Okay, Robin, yeah. are you ready? Well, I, I don't know. Um, uh, do I just run the video? Because I'm unable to start the video here, but if I share my screen, would that be sufficient? Uh, sure. Okay. Okay, just a minute. Okay, let me just get this up on the screen. Okay, all right. Okay, so now I'm gonna click on share screen. Yeah, you should do that. Okay. Um, yes, say yes. Select a window. Okay, how does that look? Okay, thanks. Can you see that? Yes, you can. You can go okay. on. Um, okay, this morning I'm going to tell you about uh, a destruction of ancient uh, petroglyphs in the northern New Mexico USA modern era. And this is the, will be about the Galisteo Basin. And we'll also see the government response. Can and you talk uh, near the microphone, please? Because uh, the, your voice is uh, a little bit shallow. Oh, okay. 
Okay, how does it sound now? Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Thanks. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so um, basically, uh, the the Galisteo Basin is part of a cultural uh, area uh, described as the Upper Rio Grande in in the prehistoric era, and this uh, this dates this. This runs from, as we can see on this map, from northern uh, Colorado here. Uh, Monte Vista, Colorado, along the Rio Grande Valley here, uh, down through, uh, and then the Galisteo Basin would be around here. And the Galisteo Basin contains contributary, contributaries to the Rio Grande River itself. So we're just gonna be looking at the uh, Galisteo Basin right around here. Uh, for today. And I'm going to show you the uh, destruction that's taken place in the past. And there's a lot of petroglyphs in this area, including historic petroglyphs, modern era petroglyphs. But I'm only going to show you the uh, photographs and instances where the ancient photographs, that is pre-contact, prehistoric petroglyphs, have been defaced during the modern era. Uh, okay, so... You have let the the presentation. You should uh, share it again. Okay. Rob. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Here we go. So, all right, so uh, here's our literature review. Uh, mostly this report is taken from uh, government documents, government produced documents. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not gonna be making any conclusions about human behavior. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to set, use these government and archeologist reports and their conclusions to set the uh, petroglyphs and the destruction that was going on in their social political context. And this will also include the chronological context and some history and cultural interpretations by the anthropologists themselves. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go on. Okay, all right, so here's our literature review. These are mostly uh, government reports. Uh, and they all re uh, relate to the Galisteo Basin, except for this McCrary one. And I put this McCrary one in because uh, in this report in 1987, he developed, he pretty much established that uh, petroglyphs could be dated from their patination. That is the degree of patination includes their, uh, uh, indicates their age, that, for example, if they have more patination, then they're older. And these other are government uh, government uh, uh, sponsored uh, studies, and the the one on the bottom that's the Bureau of Land Management plan. Those that's an administrative document that Bureau of Land Management uh, routinely uh, adopt in order to manage the lands under their jurisdiction. Okay, for legislation and government actions. Uh, we see uh, that um, these documents, including all the photographs, were obtained by myself, a private citizen, uh, by making a request under the New Mexico Inspection of Public Records Act. And you can also get ac access to some of these records through the New Mexico De State Department of Cultural Affairs ARMS database. You have to apply for access to this database and uh, the requirements and the forms to fill out are on the Department of Cultural Affairs website for the state of New Mexico. So in 1976, the New Mexico State Land Office commissioned the Lang Report from which we'll see a lot of information. Uh, in 2004, the Galisteo Basin Archeological Site Protection Act was passed as a federal law and therefore it applies to all, all the states, including New Mexico. 
and this supported the preservation and recognition of the Galiseo Basin as containing uh, many historic sites of prehistoric and Spanish colonial value. In 2005, the New Mexico State Historic Preservation Division sponsored the Munson Report, from which we'll also see a lot of photos and data. Uh, for the federal government, the CFR, the 43 CFR, that's a regulatory uh, code that applies to the statutes. It's a federal government uh, administrative code, and it basically defines how the statutes are to be carried out. And up until 2008, the Bureau of Land Management Properties, including uh, the Galisteo Basin, gunshots were considered a permitted recreational use. And we're not gonna see any examples of gunshot damage, uh, but there do exist within the Galisteo Basin other examples of this gunshot uh, gunshot damage. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, the Bureau, the Bureau of Land Management managers, they actually have discretion. And so in 2008, under the impetus of the Galisteo Basin Protection Act, uh, the, the BLM manager for this area, for the Galisteo Basin area, uh, uh, disallowed uh, shooting off guns in, in, in his jurisdiction. So that was, uh, so we see that through time, there have been some, uh, some government involvement, which has uh, contributed to the preservation of these, uh, of these uh, petroglyphs that we're gonna see that were now destroyed. Okay, so in, in 2008, uh, the, the County of Santa Fe uh, acquired the property that we're going to see, except for except for the private property, which is situated uh, uh, close to it within the Galisteo Basin. So these are some major advances that the government has made to protect these petroglyphs. Okay, so what's the culture here of these petroglyphs? Well, uh, here I'm summarizing the Lang report. And like I said, you can get a copy of this Lang report report through an Inspection of Public Records Act request or through the ARMS database if you yourself are approved to access it independently. And so basically that we have the archaic, two styles in the archaic. Then we have another style here, San Cristobal one, which doesn't really indicate that, it doesn't indicate that it was prior to San Cristobal two and three. In fact, the opposite is true. Basically it's, there's just basically no chronology. So it was kind of a, uh, in the process of naming, uh, I guess, it just got the number one designation. And it's mostly human forms, handprints, <laughs> male sexual characteristics and anatomy, no quadrupeds. And it's linked to being similar to the desert abstract style as also found at Waco Mountain, Texas and within the desert Mogollon. And so um, that's kind of interesting. And then San Cristobal four and five are obviously chrono chronologically later and are attributed to the, to the Pueblo culture. Okay, so let's look at these photographs and this tragedy that's, that has occurred in the Galisteo Basin. Okay, this is from the Munson Report. And uh, here are the archeologists in the field there managed to distinguish between uh, pecking in the stone made by stone tools, uh, as opposed to pecking in the stone made by uh, metal implements. And in this case here, they are, they've identified the bird on the top that looks like it's sitting on the top of this humanoid form's head as made by metal implements. So lucky for us, the bird isn't actually superimposed over the uh, ancient, uh, petroglyphs. And we can also see here that what's happening is that uh, that this uh, metal implement uh, person here is actually imitating the style of the ancient petroglyphs because uh, as we as you probably know, there's many examples of this bird form in ancient petroglyphs. Okay, here um, this uh, this is saying, that there's some superimpositions here. 
And so I believe it's uh, it's this right here, uh, this figure right here, or and this figure right here, described uh, as a superimpositions, and then this figure here, uh, which is kind of a cross. So uh, uh, so unfortunately, this beautiful panel has been interrupted by uh, modern intervention, but at least there's minimal overlap, say right here. Uh, there's there's some overlap here, and there's some looks like there's some overlap here of some very earlier uh, lines that go like around like this. But this is just some kind of example of the extent that people went through. And here again, they seem to be kind of imitating uh, maybe the forms of the ancient art. Okay, here we see. Uh, I'm assuming it's not too clear from the archaeologist report. But I'm assuming here that this here is ancient, that this bird here is ancient. It certainly looks like an ancient bird we've, that we've seen in many other cases. And this figure right here, which looks like the half a half lizard, typically this uh, this form goes goes down here, and that that the, these have been superimposed uh, with these scratches, and also this writing. And here we have a date in the writing, assuming this is correct. This is 1916. So this area in 1916 would have been used for ranching, maybe cattle running, maybe sheep grazing. Uh, so it would have had some traffic, some human traffic. Okay, this is sort of a, this is kind of a different sort of twist that I haven't seen before on petroglyphs. Uh, here in, as we see here at the bottom, center. Um, this was called, this was, uh, this was considered, this whole uh, arrangement here is considered a, an historic rock pile. And we here we can see the fence, a fence post with the wire, the fence wire attached to it. So this pile, rock pile could have been used as some kind of a boundary marker, or it could have been used to support the fence. Uh, easier than digging in this uh, New Mexico soil. Uh, it could have supported the fence post, but well, whatever it was used for, it, it was a historically human made and it included this rock here, um, which was described uh, wh which was described as a as a grinding stone. So technically this fits the definition of a petroglyph in that it was a peck design. Uh, on a rock, although it had a utilitarian function. So I included in this presentation to show you that historically uh, humans, um, you know, they, they saw this rock and either it's in situ where they found it, or they maybe they moved it. They, they just saw it as like any other rock and said, well, we need some kind of rocks like this to support this fence structure. So they just kind of threw it in there together with all the other rocks, but lucky for us, uh, the the surface with the uh, with the pecking on it with the grinding, uh, the results of the grinding were was up facing the sky, so we we're able to see it today. Okay, so here's a big tragedy. Uh, this rock was actually found in three uh, pieces in the field, and it was put back together by the anthropologists. Again, this shows the uh, ineptitude of the looters. Uh, they they somehow they were attempting, I guess, to uh, crack the rock maybe uh, horizontally so they could lift off uh, these petroglyphs here with the um, looks like an insect, but they failed and they broke it in different pieces and I guess they considered it useless or impossible to carry and so it remains in the field for us to see. And here's another example of some beautiful petroglyphs, uh, which were hacked apart by the looters. And uh, according to this report here, it says that uh, this report indicates that this slab here uh, was knocked out of this, this position here. Well, while this is obviously uh, chiseled out of the rock, as we can see from this, from this chisel mark here, this, this abrupt mark here, uh, that that something was chiseled out of it. However, the, this profile here doesn't really match up with any side here of this rock. 
so so you can uh you can kind of guess that what happened here was uh the looters got away with this piece they successfully removed this piece here from the site and this here they attempted to remove maybe they maybe they chipped it off right here from another rock but for some reason they decided it wasn't worth carrying uh and so they maybe they didn't like the feet or something uh but they left this uh here in the field for us to see so this is another kind of heartbreaker um uh and it contained in this report and made in 2005 Okay, this is also from the Munson report. We can see here uh, uh, the archeologist uh, evaluation of this as a footpath. So this shows repeated, repeated uh, human access to this site. And that this they uh, evaluate as a rock was actually removed. Now these, they, they didn't try to remove or they weren't removed fortunately for us so that we can see them today in place. But this just gives you some kind of idea of the entrenchment of the looting that went on uh, prior to 2005. Okay, this is from uh, another uh, another locale. Uh, although it was in the same report, it's from another locale within the Galiseo Basin. And here uh, I've actually uh, I've I've penciled, I've marked in, I've inked in the archaic uh, petroglyphs which were indicated because there's so little contrast here, it's very difficult to see from the photo. But you can see the photo yourself if you get this report. And uh, the, uh, and uh, for, as far as this up here, the archeologists, they only say a recent face added. Well, obviously it's recent because there's no patina on it, but they don't go into whether or not this was vandalism. And so, I mean, I would kind of pretty much call this vandalism because this doesn't look like any kind of uh, symbolism or design motif that uh, ancient native people uh, uh, created. In fact, it looks like a cartoon, like it's kind of making fun of it. So, um, if you so if this is vandalism, then um, then that's another tragedy. But at least we have the archaic uh, the ar archaic uh, left over here. Okay, the Lang report has a lot of information as we see, as we've seen here, the cultural uh, evaluation and conclusions uh, made by Lang. And Lang also has a literature review. And he also describes the, the petroglyphs in a great form. And he describes this one particularly tragic scratch across a, a Pueblo pictograph panel. And uh, maybe it's just as well like there's no photo, so we don't start crying about it. And uh, he says, there is some suggestion that danger of vandalism may be on the increase. Well, I believe, yeah, I think so. So as early as 1977 then, uh, we had an archeologist evaluation that although there wasn't a lot going on, that there was, a, there was definitely a risk. And also we see here uh, his second, uh, his second, um, description here uh, of uh, uh, his overall evaluation of the time span of the archaic through the Mexican period. The Mexican period ended in uh, 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So, uh, so the, even as early as 1977, the petroglyphs were allowed to be dated by the anthropologists based on patina and other, um, maybe some stratigraphy or maybe some just knowledge, common knowledge. Uh, so he basically says that there's a lot of pictographs even, and as well as petroglyphs for the late Pueblo four and Pueblo five times. Robin, you must uh, conclude your presentation, please. Okay, that's the end. That's my last slide. If there's any questions, you can contact me or you can get the reports yourself. We have the discussion at the end also. Uh, oh, great. Okay. In okay. case. Thank yeah. you very much for your okay. presentation. Okay. Stop sharing. Yes. Stop sharing. Okay. Yes, okay. Okay. And now we go to.
to Kirk uh, Astro. The yes. use of color card for photographing purposes. Yes. Thank you, Kirk. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for allowing me an opportunity to uh, participate in this conference today. Um, I'm going to start with what might be considered by many people here a bold statement, but I think the IFRO color card has outlived its usefulness, and it's time to replace it in rock art photography and research. Gory might be the only one on the call who uh, would agree with me. But I plan to share with you some of the reasons that I've come to this conclusion and hope that IFRO might uh, look into adopting new color photography standards. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this. I've seen this card in several people's uh, photographs here today uh, as you've documented things. This is the card that uh, I'm talking about. And uh, basically, the card, as many of you probably know, have uh, a couple of uh, purposes. Uh, one of its most useful purposes is to determine the size of an object. But it was designed by Bednarek over 30 years ago as a tool for uh, photo, uh, focusing photographic equipment and to do color optimization and correction back in the lab. Uh, I'm going to share with you a research project I was involved with as a part of my master's uh, research in 2020, uh, where I was analyzing varnish color uh, on both dated and undated ancient uh, petroglyphs. And basically, my research was driven by several questions. I've just picked these out uh, for the purposes of today. There's an assumption in rock art research that the darker a petroglyph, the older it is. And that's a that's a big assumption. I don't think it's ever been proven. Uh, there's people on this call that pr probably correct me if I'm wrong. But it's an assumption we make that the varnish on petroglyphs, if it's dark, means it's much older. And so I wanted to find out if darkness on a varnish on petroglyphs is a proxy for age. And if so, historic inscriptions should be lighter than the older uh, pre-Columbian petroglyphs that I studied here in uh, the American Southwest. And I also was trying to find out if varnish color could be accurately and consistently measured with uh, several modern instruments. I used three techniques, and I'm not going to go into all of these because they're not really relevant to this discussion about the IFRO card, but um, I did follow Bednarek's research steps precisely to analyze digital photographs that were color corrected to the IFRO scale in Photoshop. I also employed a modern photo, uh, portable spectrophotometer that analyzes colors, and I used a light meter that has been used in a few other research projects on uh, petroglyphs to measure uh, the color of the varnish. My uh, design, I looked at three sites here in Arizona that were intentionally selected because they had a large number of dated graffiti. And you can see one of those things on the left. And I compared the color of the varnish uh, with all of those dated images, but I also compared the color of the varnish with these more ancient pre-Columbian uh, petroglyphs that were found in the same place. And just to make sure that uh, people, people know, I know you can't compare uh, varnish color from one site to another. So all the comparisons I did were at the same site, but I had three different sites in Arizona. Uh, to try to uh, uh, work on this color comparison of the varnish. Bednarek, when he pioneered this process in the late 1990s, um, published what he called an experimental study where he analyzed just seven petroglyphs. Probably not a large enough uh, data set to really analyze varnish color. So I used uh, over 80 petroglyphs uh, as a part of my study. The problem I found was in many cases was this. This is a, probably the most extreme example I could share. Um, the, the 
gloss cover on the IFRO card and some of its components cause it to wash out and no amount of changing my camera angle or color settings on my camera would correct for this. And so there were certain petroglyphs that uh, it became uh, very difficult to really color correct back in the lab because the colors uh, were not true. So I began to experiment with using other color cards. I noticed that Robin had one of these in her previous presentation. This is the GD, G, DGK color passport card. And uh, it actually is a more modern example, uses a lot more color swatches, has more gray and white scales than the IFRO card. And so I began to see how that compared to the IFRO card which you can see at the bottom of this picture, which still has an appearance that's relatively washed out compared to that other card. Here's just another example of where I was using uh, the, these two cards on some dated inscriptions. This one from 1931 and uh, the DGK color card. And I uh, included this one from 1933 because we're going to see this in a while. Again, you can see the color card uh, that IFRO has is kind of washed out in this particular uh, picture. It made it very difficult to analyze varnish color according to Bednarik's methods when I got back to the lab. But remember this date uh, because we'll see it here in uh, just a few minutes. I, I should add that uh, at the sites that I studied in Arizona, the 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 available uh, age or space uh, age range of dated inscriptions was only about 150 years. Uh, the most re uh, oldest was around 1848, uh, when the Mormon battalion came through southern Arizona on their way to California. So we don't have a large uh, span of years to analyze dated graffiti, but uh, that's what we had in Arizona. Uh, this is me uh, using the spectrophotometer to do some of the other color analysis. And again, for the purposes of today, I can't really go in to the results that uh, I found from the spectrophotometer or the light meter. But I just wanted to show you how that uh, particular tool is used in the field. I feel it's it's got a lot of potential. It was never designed for petroglyph research, but I think uh, it's one of the things that's going to be more, more useful in the future. And the spectrophotometer is based on a, a four color component code where the IFRO card is based on a trichromatic theory of color. Uh, this is what the Hunter Lab uh, color scheme is based on and analyzed by the spectrophotometer. It's often called the opponent uh, color theory. And again, for the purposes of today, I'm not going to try to delve into color theory. Uh, you can read all about it in my uh, research if you'd like to, to know more. So um, at the risk of having people glaze over uh, in their <laughs> today as I present this, I wanted to show some of the results with the color card uh, that I use to analyze petroglyphs. This particular uh, chart is a regression analysis of the dated inscriptions that I analyzed at the Painted Rock Petroglyph site, which is about uh, 50 miles west of Gila Bend. And, th and this is actually a, a pretty good uh, pretty good showing for the IFRO card. Uh, the, the line in the middle is the regression line. We would hope that uh, most of those images line up along it. On the left axis is the darkness of color. So the 250 at the upper left is very dark down to, of course, zero, which is uh, no darkness or white. And um, along the x-axis are the dates of these inscriptions. So you can see that the oldest one here at Painted Rock was 18, uh, around 1889. Uh, and a majority of these petroglyph dated inscriptions fall within the 95% confidence intervals, which are represented by those curved lines on both sides. Not too bad. Um, this, this, this chart says that when we looked at the red, green, blue mean value, again, following Bednarik's research methods to the T, this is what we came up with. But it wasn't true uh, in a large majority of the cases. And here, here is one uh, that is contrary to that. 
the regression line actually goes the wrong direction. It goes up uh, towards darkness uh, as you get to the more modern inscriptions. You can see that the 95% confidence intervals are much wider. And that purple arrow that's at the bottom is marking that inscription we saw earlier of 1933. You can see it falls outside the 95% confidence intervals. And if you look closely, it's actually, according to the color analysis that I did, it's showing that it's darker than the inscription that's there as 1885, which, you know, just it doesn't make sense. Uh, and again, this is a problem with the IFRO color card. One more uh, piece of statistics to share with you, uh, again, without getting too far into the weeds. Uh, one of the statistical uh, tools that you can use in this kind of research when you have small sample sizes and you can you assume that the data is not normally distributed uh, is uh, what's called a Mann-Whitney test that results in these things called box and whisker plots. And so this, this chart from the Painted Rock Petroglyph site shows two groups. Group one are the dated graffiti images, and group two are the undated ancient pre-Columbian petroglyphs. The very dark line right in the middle shows what the median for both of those groups would be in terms of color darkness of varnish. You can see it's about 115. And the dark line within the blue boxes is the median for that group of petroglyphs. The trouble is that you see with the box, it overlaps uh, with the, uh, the, the group one box overlaps with the group two box, showing that there was not a significant difference in varnish color between dated and ancient pre-Columbian petroglyphs. And this is the result I found in many cases um, in part attributed to the IFRO card and its inability to provide an accurate color correction for photographs in rock art research. So here's just a little bit of a summary of what I found and um, uh, um, uh, Echevarria is just one of those, Bob Marks is another one. There's been several people that have raised some concerns about the IFRO card. The glossy coating that reflects sunlight, the small size of the color squares for color correction in software programs. I mentioned the inadequate number of grayscales. Um, Photoshop actually may not be the best software program for doing color analysis. Other researchers have been experimenting with Lightroom and other programs that may be better choices. And the IFRO card fades quickly over time, rendering them pretty useless except as a as a measurement scale. Here are some of the other color uh, cards that are available out there. I mentioned the DGK color card, and like I said, Robin had that in a couple of her photos. Um, I'm sure Gory has probably used this, and the Shumla research folks are using this x rite color checker passport, which they feel is far superior to um, any of the others that are currently out there for use in the field. The advantages of these cards is that you can color calibrate them through um, uh, Adobe Lightroom and it's automatic. They come in a protective cover, which pr protects it from dust. And the color science behind the color patches is consistently checked and updated. The color patches are matte instead of glossy like the IFRO card that cuts and then so they cut down on glare. And there's a white balance card on the reverse side of the color checker that contains an 18% gray balance card as well. So there's, there's lots of uh, good features with that. And the exposure scale is built right into the x right color passport. So you don't have to um, guess at what that exposure should be with your photographs. And they're also easy to attach to a selfie stick or some other apparatus to reach uh, uh, tall or out of the way places where petroglyphs might be located. So in summary, I um, mean, why the red, green, blue means may be effective for accessing the antiquity of rock engravings. There is a need for more recent color scales in petroglyph and pictograph 
photography. The current card, as I said, developed more than 30 years ago, has outlived its usefulness and doesn't meet the requirements for modern digital photography and color correction software programs. And there needs to be more rigorous research into the use of color scales in archeology span and particularly rock art research and the software applications used for that. And so I would encourage IFRO as an organization to um, take the initiative to identify a new color standard for rock art research. Um, this is uh, the, the, the research that I did. This photograph is from the Painted Rock Petroglyph site where there's over 5,000 petroglyphs on this little hill. Uh, my master's thesis is available through TDAR and lots of other public places, academia, EDU. And um, I want to thank you for your time and um, hope that uh, that was of interest to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kirk, for a very interesting presentation. Yes. And I hope that Ifra will consider your, uh, your proposal. Now yes. we go to Stephen Waller that we talk about the activities of the San Diego Rock Art Association. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I've started to share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I'm Steve Waller. And I am vice president and IFRAO representative for the San Diego Rock Art Association here in Southern California. And rather than show a PowerPoint slide, I'm gonna take you on a live tour of our webpage of the San Diego Rock Art Association. And you can find this yourself if you want to um, by just typing in San rockart.org or just sdraa.org but um, I'm just going to walk and um, to to familiarize you with our organization and I'm happy to be responding to this invitation to present search objectives our publications conferences international projects and prospects for the future. So um, what I'm gonna do is just walk you through this and, and just show you um, what we're all about. Now, we were accepted into the IFRAO relatively recently in 2020. We have 113 members. And as you can see here, our mission statement is that the San Diego Rock Art Association is dedicated to educating the public about rock art, providing an environment for scholarly research, and promoting the preservation and conservation of rock art. So I'm going to um, show you how our organization is fulfilling that um, objective. So this is our homepage. And then um, I'm gonna walk you through the various other pages that we have to familiarize you with our organization. So th this next page is our contact information in terms of like email addresses and all that. And it also shows you that um, we are a nonprofit organization and also mentions here that we are now a member of the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations, the IFRAO. And we are run by a core committee of volunteers, um, as you can see here listing, where we do um, duties amongst ourselves. And so one of our main um, things that our organization does is to have meetings. And we have six meetings a year. They're usually held on um, even numbered months, such like February, and usually on the second Sunday of the month. So um, what we have are announcements and our next one is Sunday, June 11th, that will be given by Mavis Greer. 
and you can um, see all of the details of that. Now, we also have an archives page. Oh, and you can um, click to register for that. This is a Zoom meeting. We used to hold our meeting in person, but after the um, pandemic, we started to have them by Zoom. So they are free meetings and you can just click to register. You just put in your name and the email. And if somebody else is going to be watching you with you, you can just tell us who that is and then hit submit. And then you will get an email um, with the link. So it's very to participate. And we have been giving these talks now for about 13 years, ever since we started our organization back in 2009. So um, here's a list of the various talks. Ken Hedges gave the first one back in June 2009. And I gave the second one and et cetera. So you can see all those, um, all the different ones. Here's another one that I gave. And anyway, so you can read about the various topics and who gave this, the um, talks. So this year, which is shown on page two, so far we've um, had talks by Jeff Lefebvre talking about rock art of the world. And um, this was in celebration of the book that he recently published called Rock Art of the World. And it was a fabulous presentation. And then we had David Lee presenting on Rock Art of Australia. So you can see that even though we are an organization that is located in San Diego, Southern California, our topics co cover the whole um, rock art around the world. Um, okay, so in addition to those meetings that we have every other month, um, our members have um, field trips that they can attend and we have social events. So if you do want to join, even if you're not in San Diego, you are welcome to join. And there's an online membership application and you could become part of our mailing list to tell you about our events, including the Zoom meetings, which are free even to non-members, but um, it's easy enough to join. So the next um, page of our web page is about our symposium. And that we held um, every November. This is the first Saturday in November every year. And this will be actually our 48th symposium. This symposium started um, by the Museum of Man here in Balboa Park in San Diego. And it has been a symposium that's a full day. And in the past, it was attended by people mostly um, in the United States who would come, but it was welcome to anybody in the world. But recently, they have been also Zoom meetings. And so it can be attended by anybody um, around the world. And we encourage you to not only uh, attend, but to also contribute. So we haven't yet put out the call of papers for this year's symposium, but it should be coming up soon. And um, typically we have several hundred people that have been attending our Zoom meetings. So it's even um, a larger audience than we have for our local one. And the, these symposiums are actually how our organization came into existence because people from all over were coming to our symposiums held here in San Diego. And a bunch of us realized, hey, we're local. Why don't we get together more often than just once a year? So that's how we um, came to join to um, establish our own organization. So what 
you can do is also um, find out an idea of what symposiums are like and like the, um, the table of contents basically for the last one. And these are then published, these presentations um, are published in the journal called Rock Art Papers. And we're up to volume 19. Volume 20 is going to be coming out very soon. And um, these are for the authors of those presentations who wish to have it um, published. So here's an example of the last one that you can look through. Um, and that one is available from Sunbelt Publications, but the previous ones are out of print at this point. So let's see. Um, the next page is about support of our organization. There are people that we thank here, and then there's an opportunity for you to donate to our organization if you would like and to support us in addition to becoming a member. Um, the next one is we have a page for news and information. There's a shortcut to the resources, which I'll show you in a second. And then there's some links to um, various other websites that people have found very useful, such as the D-Stretch and the Rock Art Studies Bibliographic Database, where you can search for various um, publications, not only in the Rock Art Papers, but it's a collection of um, publications that is searchable. And then also links to the Aurora Lecture Series. We do not um, record our Zoom presentations, but um, other people do, like Aurora and URAR. So let's then go to this resources page. We have um, several things on here, including what we call SDRAA in action. And let me just show you that. So periodically we put out kind of like a newsletter that is an opportunity for our members to share what they've been doing, their research. Um, this is kind of like a informal, personal um, description of like what people are doing and where they're going. And it's just kind of like a fun way to keep in touch with each other and show um, various things that our members are doing. So let me show you that that's our latest one. And then we had, um, let's see, that was number three. Oh, here's, okay, here's the first one down here. Okay, so again, this just gives you an opportunity to see what our, our members are doing. Here's a picture of uh, our core committee, most of us, and we are at the logo site of our organization. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is um, the logo of our organization that is in a rock art site very close to um, San Diego. And then let me just show you quickly the other one, just so you can see also some of our uh, field trips and what we've been up to. Um, here, here's a picture of a field trip that we went to. And also some of us went to the IFRAO meeting in Valka Monica in 2018. Um, Again, it's just to give you an idea of what's going on. So the other thing that we have here is, let's see, we have, oh, what happened? Um, 
somehow I think I closed that screen. Can you still um, see? Can you still see my screen? Yes, but it's full okay. of uh, files. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now what I have to do, sorry, is to open that um, web page again because somehow it it didn't show up now. So I'm going to just show you how easy it is to get to our web page, sdraa.org. There we go. Okay, I'm going to go back to resources and go to our 10th anniversary um, description. So, Actually, one of the ways that we celebrated our 10th anniversary was to um, decide to join the IFRAO. Yeah, but so, you are still on the on the other page. We are not seeing. Can you see? Um, it says San Diego Rock Art Organization no. Association. The first 10 years. No. You no, cannot see that. You see the black page with your uh, bias. Okay. Um, okay i'm not sure why that's happening because i have I, it's saying i'm sharing my screen and my screen here shows uh okay let's see. oh i see it stopped sharing because the window was closed. So I guess I have to not only open that window, but to share again. So let me do that. How's that? Can you now see the first 10 years? Yes, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna just do that. Okay, so this shows um, this is a compilation of how our organization came into being. Like I described, it was kind of an offshoot of the San Diego Rock Art Symposium and how we came into being and what we've been doing, how we celebrated it descriptions of some of our field trips and also um, some of the research doing. It's just um, kind of a, a documentation of our first 10 years. And some memorials of people um, who were members who are no longer with us, sadly. And so, also, one of the things that we are really concentrated on is our conservation efforts. We have a rock art site near us called Piedra Pentadas, which unfortunately was subjected to severe vandalism. So we have <clears throat> taken it upon ourselves to um, have it professionally conserved to get rid of the um, vandalism while preserving the actual rock art. And we've put into place measures to help prevent future um, vandalism. And, <clears throat> and then let's see, the other thing is we were talking about the symposia at, um, that we've held year after year. So if you want to look at like the programs from previous years, you can also do that. Because not all of the presentations at the symposium are followed by a publication in rock art papers. So in some cases, this serves as documentation for what people talked about and, and who the presenters were. And then there's some links to other, like some various videos. We also have our code of ethics, 
which um, we make sure that our, our members and other people of the public are aware of um, the conduct that, um, you know, you should be very careful of the rock art, to conserve the rock art when you're visiting. So I hope that um, this has served as an introduction to our organization. And I want to mention that we are actively seeking speakers for not only the symposium for 20 minute talks um, that we hold in November, but also for our monthly or bi-monthly meetings. So if anybody is interested in becoming a speaker, um, please contact us at this contact information. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Steve, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And now uh, we have the discussion. So everybody online and uh, also on YouTube can start uh, with uh, questions or remarks. I have a question. Uh, you can hear me? Who? Ah, can you hear sorry, me? yes. Uh, I would like to ask Kirk um, if it's possible after, you know, these critics to the IFRAO uh, scale, if it's possible to produce another uh, similar scale, you know, that, that is more efficient to, to, to do this analysis and, and, you know, to work with, because the only, the one or the, you know, um, positive things about the uh, IFRAO scale is that it's standard, you know, and you have these cheap colors, but, you prove that this is not enough, but what what, what, can, what uh, can we do about it here? Okay, the question was for- I think not here. <laughs> therapy, yes. No. Let's see. Other questions? <laughs> Yeah, there. I, I couldn't uh, talk because my, I was um, muted by by you guys. But um, yeah, thanks, Gore. I'm I'm not surprised you're asking me that question. It's very good. Uh, I know the the uh, IFRO card is standard in the field, and it's advantageous because it's small and easily portable. But I really do believe that the uh, DGK card <clears throat> is probably um, more appropriate. Uh, it's a little larger, but it's still fairly portable and it comes in a protective case. It's easy to uh, put and mount next to petroglyphs for research. A bigger issue, I think, is that um, uh, doing color uh, analysis with digital photography through any software program is extremely labor intensive. And that more modern instruments like the light meter and particularly the spectrophotometer, I think, hold out a lot more uh, uh, potential for uh, the kind of research, at least, that I was doing. If you're going to look at uh, analysis of varnish, uh, the, the drawback, of course, with the spectrophotometer is it costs about $10,000. Uh, not everybody's going to be able to afford that to take it to the field. So uh, if people are intent on using a color card, I think that DGK or the color right passport that Shumla is using uh, present better alternatives. I mean, one of the things IFRO could do is engage with several researchers to carry out some studies to uh, look at those different cards and maybe come up with their own standard. Uh, after 30 years, as I said, I think it's outlived its usefulness. Thank you, Kurt. I was, uh, uh, I had a remarks, not a question, about uh, this, your study, interesting study on uh, the patina revarnishing of the, of the figures. As uh, I think you should consider that uh, the, the revarnishing can change not only from site to site, but also from rock to rock, depending also on the exposition. If uh, a flat rock, 
will not have the same uh, patina of a, a vertical rock or a slope, slopey rock. And uh, so I think the suggestion is to study the revarnishing on the same rock, not only in the same site. Yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, again, my study was pretty extensive, so I couldn't cite all of the things. But at the end, uh, I observed that, yeah, the, the images varnish at different rates, depending on whether they're vertical, horizontal, or even in an alcove. I also think that a sophisticated study would look at varnishing, varnishing on figures that are at the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west because I noticed just in my research that there were differences in the varnish formation depending on where those were located in a geographic kind of location. So there's lots that could be done looking at different angles on the rock, uh, certainly within the same site. Uh, you know, if you, if you have to use dated graffiti, uh, you're limited because there's not a lot of dated graffiti out there that uh, you can analyze. And so far, 150 years isn't enough to really discern differences in varnish formation. Yeah, depending on the different rocks, type of rocks can, can change the, the varnish. Exactly. Thanks. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any other uh, remarks or uh, questions on the presentation that uh, we had this uh, afternoon? Well, yeah, um, this is a uh, Robin Wakeland, and as far as the um, patina and evaluating the petroglyphs on the basis of patina, you can check out my McCrary uh, reference under my literature page on my slideshow. You can get a hold of this report from uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs. It's in the ARMS database. And also you can get a, a copy of it from uh, an Inspection of Public Records Act request if you don't qualify for access to the ARMS database because uh, in 1987, he was uh, defining how to date petroglyphs from patination. So anything, and we include a literature review, anything up through 1987 on that subject. Okay, thank you, Robin. You're welcome. Any other uh, questions? You tengo. I have another question. Um, I would like to, to ask Jesus, but I would like to ask him in Spanish and he can answer me in, in English if you want. Roy, ¿cómo estás? Eh, una pregunta, um, precioso Roy. He visto que has puesto eh, cosas de Brasil, ¿no? En este, en este en esta línea desértica que lo mencionaste, que se parece mucho a la de Bolivia, ¿no? Y, y después de tus años de estudios en el, este, estas quilcas o arte rupestre en el límite andino-amazónico, eh, ¿tú crees que hay una tradición conjunta desde Perú? Porque he visto muchas cosas similares en el área de Machu Picchu y en otras zonas. ¿Tú crees que hay una tradición similar entre Perú, Bolivia y, y Brasil? You can answer me in English, please. Well, what I presented is the uh, hypothesis of the dry diagonal coming from Piauí or coming from Ceará states and reaching uh, Chiquitania, which is southeast Bolivia. But the dry diagonal has three types of vegetation. One is the SD. TF, which means seasonally dry tropical forests. The dry diagonal also includes grasslands and also includes Chaco type vegetation. So it extends towards the Chaco of Argentina and the Chaco of Paraguay. Uh, Peru is completely different. If we try to reach Peru from the Piauí state or Ceará state, you have to pass a bit through the Amazon jungle, which is a humid jungle. The same occurs with Colombia because some of researchers from Colombia now are mentioning the presence of Northeast uh, tradition paintings in Colombia. So uh, I think Rauni Valle is very certain and uh, 
uh, he's correct in proposing this dry, dry diagonal based on these ecological, the same ecological uh, vegetation. And that explains the possibility of these uh, big, well, diaspora or migrations. We don't know exactly, or if it is just the diffusion of concepts, uh, but uh, it is not related with Peru. But of course, uh, migrations or the diffusion of ideas could uh, happen anywhere, but not in this sense with a Ted, with a Northeast tradition. Thanks. Thank you. Saludos, Gori. <laughs> Any other uh, remarks or questions? Otherwise, we will close the session for today and we will talk, uh, we will connect again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock for the second uh, day. Okay, let's do that. Oh, let's do that. And good uh, evening uh, or good morning, <laughs> depending on where you are, to everybody. And thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.